just a courtesy announcement that we are now live on the internet and our meeting portal. Good morning, Rebecca. Good morning. Thank you for being here. Have a great meeting. Good morning, Supervisor Sumidian. Good morning, Rhonda. Sound check. How are we doing? We're doing great. You sound loud and clear, coming in strong, and your video looks good today. Thank you, ma'am. Have a good day. Thanks, you as well. Good morning, Kevin. Good morning. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. Meeting will start at 9 30. Perfect. You. Good morning, Rosaline. Good morning, Casey. Casey, if you spoke, we were unable to hear you. Recording in progress. Good morning, President Wasserman. Good morning, Rhonda. Happy Tuesday. Indeed, indeed. Your clerk today is going to be the lovely Jill Mendoza. I'm sorry, you said it was Jill? Jill. Jill, thank you. Jill Mendoza. Jill Mendoza, I know her. All right. Good morning. Good morning. Bear with me, everyone. I've misplaced something very important here. Uh, 
I will, I will find it. All right, how are we doing on supervisors? Do we have five? You have five. Thank you. Roll call vote, please. Jill. Good morning, Supervisor Lee. Good morning, President. Supervisor Chavez. Here. Supervisor Simidian. Here. Vice President Ellenberg. I'm here. And President Wasserman. Here as well. Thank you all very much. And with that, if you'll please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. Today, it is to be led by Supervisor Simidi and all those who can stand, please do so. I pledge allegiance yes. to the flag yes. of the United States, States of America, America. and to the to Republic, Republic for which it stands, one nation, one nation liberty, under God, indivisible, and justice for all. Thank you very much, Supervisor. With that, we're going to turn to Supervisor Chavez, who has the invocator for today. Supervisor Chavez. Thank you very much, colleagues. In honor of Women's History Month, the nomination of the first Black woman to the Supreme Court, and most recently, Black History Month in February, I would like to honor and welcome a very special guest. For our invocation this month, I would like to introduce Reverend Alicia Partee. Reverend Partee is the executive pastor at Maranatha Christian Center and a licensed marriage and family therapist. She is a sharp, thoughtful leader with a mission to break down barriers wherever they may be. She builds bridges and empowers people to live their lives in the most authentic, authentic way possible. She previously worked as the president of the Professional Women's Network in Norway, where she designed and implemented an international mentoring program and led the strategy to advance diversity, inclusion, and gender-based leadership. Reverend Partee, welcome, and thank you so much for joining us. The floor is yours. Thank you to uh, Honorable uh, Cindy Chavez. And we, I, I'm, a, I'm grateful for the invitation and to the remainder of the board as well. Thank you. So there is truly power mm -hmm in agreement. I recently read the six triple eight. They were a trailblazing group of heroes who were the only all black women army corps battalion to serve overseas during World War II. Facing both racism and sexism in a war zone, these women sorted millions of pieces of mail to get them to going through millions of backlogs, ensuring that members of the services received these letters that their loved ones have sent. They dodged U-boats from the German and made it to different ports. They were deployed in unheated, rat-infested airplane hangars in Birmingham, England, and given a daunting mission to process the millions of pieces of mail. Undelivered mail that was sitting there to government workers, the military, Red Cross workers, mountains of mail. And they had a motto, no mail, low morale. Well, what if we stood in agreement today? We're facing war over in Ukraine. We see innocent people dying, racism still at large. We're facing tyranny, terrorism, a total disregard for human life, where people are pawns for personal gain and personal power. But we as women, men, Christians, Jews, Muslims, Buddhists, Africans, descents, whites, Asians, Hispanics, and so many more have come together to stand together in while well, this war, against this war. We're standing together, old and young. We're coming together to take a stand. Well, what if we had a new motto? We stand together when there is war, and we stand together when there is peace. We stand together and we stand for the people. We make decisions. When we make decisions, we make them for the people. And God help us all. Have a blessed meeting today and thank you for the invitation. Thank you, Pastor, and thank you, Supervisor Chavez. We now move on to item four, which is announcing adjournments in memoriam. And the first two are by Supervisor Chavez. Thank you, and thank you colleagues for allowing me this honor today. Today we adjourn in memory of Mary Holbert. I want to acknowledge and welcome Mary's daughter, Rosaline uh, Sitch, who I think is with us, and welcome Rebecca, it's good to see you. And we know we have many of their family and friends who are joining us today. 
I'm so honored that you've also chosen to, to join us. Miss Mary Halbert was born in Dumfries, Scotland on October 28, 1922. Anyone who knew Mary remembers her contagious smile and the brightest twinkle in her eyes. She was adventurous and loved sports, food, travel, and performing arts. She was also hardworking and feisty. At a young age, Mary helped her family um, farm with livestock. She was then sent away from home to train as a nurse during World War II. It was there where she met and fell in love with her first husband, Art, a Yank staff sergeant, and had two children. After the war, Mary came to California on the Queen Mary with her children and worked at the Del Monte Cannery as a nurse and later in retail at the Emporium at Valley Fair. Then in the early 1960s, she married Harold Holbert, to whom she remained married until her passing. Mary and Harold worked together daily at the Diamond Laundry and Cleaners and got to travel all over the world. Mary became known as Miss Careful, making herself a constant at the Diamond Laundry and Cleaners for over 50 years. Some of you may have noticed the iconic Miss Careful wooden billboard sign at the Diamond Laundry in downtown. That is Mary with her beautiful smile, iconic blonde curls and pearl earrings. For years, her image greeted customers and drivers and will continue to do so for decades to come through the continuation of her family business. Mary was a symbol of hard work, adventure, and a constant beacon of joy to all of those who knew her. Mary passed peacefully at home at the age of 99. Mary's legacy lives on. She is survived by her children, Rosaline and Gary, her five grandchildren, Alex, Rebecca, Jason, Janelle, and Justin, and her great granddaughter, Gia. Thank you so much for allowing me to share her memory as she is a iconic figure in all of downtown and San Jose, but also with her family to say a very sincere thank you for letting us honor her today. Thank you, Supervisor, and the next one is yours too. Thank you. Today, we also adjourn in memory of Doug Moore. I'd like to acknowledge and welcome Doug's wife, Kim Wynn, and their family and friends who are joining us. And I'd also like to acknowledge and welcome retired South Bay reporter and anchor Rob Flavido, um, who worked with Doug for years at KNTV, known as NBC Bay Area. For thousands of residents in Santa Clara County, I know we're gonna do a, a PowerPoint um, of some pictures. Um, for thousands of residents in Santa Clara County, Doug Moore was like a family member who came into their living rooms every night for almost 20 years to deliver the news of the day. In fact, to this day, Doug Moore and Maggie Skira hold the record as the longest tenured anchor team in Bay Area television history. The natural chemistry and ease between Doug and Maggie was not lost on loyal viewers with their rare combination of credibility, empathy, and integrity. In the hectic world of broadcast news, Doug often set a tone in and out of the newsroom with intelligence, a great sense of humor, and a calm response uh, and calm presence. Doug had a sixth sense when it came to reading people. He inherently knew when reporters and guests were nervous on the set with the bright lights and fast pace. He would inevitably bring out the best in them with his interviewing skills. And for those who tried to avoid answering his questions, well, he could bring, bring out the worst in them. It all went with the news territory. Doug was a natural born leader who coached and developed producers, writers, reporters, and anchors for many years, always under the radar. He was a stickler about writing around the TV visuals instead of stating the obvious and fact checking. Those who worked with Doug never wanted to disappoint him and that speaks volumes. He was a constant at, constant at community events in Santa Clara County never failing to give his time and energy to any cause, especially after the Loma Prieta earthquake. He was always a strong believer in paying it forward and kindness after experiencing tragedy in his own life. And anyone who worked with Doug will tell you he was the coolest guy in the room without even trying. There was always a bit of swagger and knowing a knowing smile when he walked into any room. Despite Doug's very public persona, he was a private man and a bit of an introvert. Doug loved his wife, Kim, and their two daughters, Jaden and Maya, who he, and he, who he became Mr. Dad to after he retired from the news and became a fixture at their soccer games. 
He loved his grown sons, Nate and Matthew, his dogs, sailing, books, fine bourbon, bread pudding, and all desserts. Doug passed away on December 19th after a long battle with Parkinson's syndrome. Surrounded by his family, he was 78 years old. I'd like to thank Doug and his entire family for allowing us to share his memory. And now Doug's wife, Kim, will be joining us. Kim, uh, you're on mute. We're not, we're not able to hear you, Kim. There we go. <clears throat> you're still muted. Yeah, she's unmuted, but. We're not able to hear you, but you know what we'll do while you work on your um, your mute, we'll go to Rob. That may have been what you were telling me to do. <laughs> so I'm gonna invite former television newsman, Rob Flabado, uh, who worked with Doug for several years and they had a lot in common. Rob is joining us from Grass Valley where he recently retired. Rob? Yeah, hi, Cindy. Can you hear me okay this morning? Sure can, good yes. morning. Hey, thanks for including me in on this and uh, hi to Kim, hi to the board. Um, you know, it was my pleasure to have worked with Doug for, uh, for 12 years over there at 645 Park Avenue. Um, I learned a lot from Doug. He was just a super writer and a, and, a, and a super good polished anchor man. And if you were around in the 80s, you may have remember something called the San Jose News Channel. Uh, Doug was the, the face of this along with Maggie. This was when KNTV... Uh, embarked upon this bold uh, experiment ahead of its time, I dare say, to focus all of the coverage on San Jose. So Doug and Maggie and people like Robert Honda and uh, Beth Willon, Terry McSweeney, Ken Wayne, myself, Danny Garza, a whole lot of other people. Um, we owned coverage in San Jose for a number of years there, second only perhaps to the Mercury News, but in any case, it was just a whole lot of fun. <laughs> Um, I can still see Doug uh, over there at his news desk banging away on that manual royal typewriter. This was, of course, was before cell phones, and before laptop computers. And so uh, it was just a whole lot of fun in those days. Um, sorry to see them go, but I also had a chance to, to know Doug a little bit outside of work. Sadly, something we don't see a whole lot of these days. We went fishing over in Santa Cruz, we rented those little 10 foot skiffs off the Capitola Wharf and we'd go out a couple of miles fishing salmon. And we talked about fish stories and we talked about ice fishing. Doug and I had similar career paths in that um, my first job was in Aberdeen, South Dakota. Doug's first job I think was in Fargo, North Dakota. So we shared a lot of war stories about that. Uh, Doug went on to work in Milwaukee and eventually he was an anchor in Minneapolis where I watched him growing up in high school. He co-anchored with the legendary Dave Moore, same last name. So it was Dave Moore and Doug Moore. Uh, their catchphrase was there's more, more and more on four. And uh, later when I was going to college in St. Cloud, I went to, uh, we did a field trip down to Minneapolis and I, I watched Doug do the news at WCCO. And Little did I know that uh, later, uh, I, just a few years later, I would be working alongside him uh, at KNTV. So he was just a, a great writer. I learned a lot from Doug. Uh, he was uh, my mentor in many ways. And as uh, Cindy said earlier, you know, Doug had a swagger about him. He was just the coolest guy. And uh, I, I really uh, look back on those days very fondly. And uh, thanks again for letting me weigh in this morning. We, we lost one of the really good ones uh, with Doug. So God rest him. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rob. Kim? Can you hear me now? Perfectly. Yes. Oh, great. All right. Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you, Supervisor Chavez and members of the Board of uh, Supervisor and uh, the community at large. Uh, Doug would have been so touched by this honor. Um, even though he was known for what he did on TV, what was most meaningful to him was really the opportunity to, con to uh, connect with the community in Santa Clara County. He felt beyond just reading the news, being in service to the many community organizations that he supported or just 
stopping to show kindness to people he would see in the streets was a much more worthy calling. Um, and he often told me and our kids, a life worth living is a life in service to others. He really took that to heart in the way he approached his job and certainly his life. And I know he's made a deep and lasting impression on the people here based on all the beautiful messages of condolence that I've seen over social media and certainly by today's tribute. Um, Doug was last on air in 2001. 20 years have gone by in a flash. And he spent most of that time raising our two daughters, Jaden and Maya, after having already raised two fine men, Nate and Matt. And um, in whatever spare time he had left, he indulged in his adventurous and creative sides. He sailed, he rode his motorcycle, he wrote, he painted, he made music. But old habits die hard, and he was still a news junkie. He still enjoyed following the news and delivering an evening report, um, even if it was just for an audience of one. And <laughs> today, I sorely miss my nightly Doug Moore news analysis. If Doug were here today, he'd sign off by thanking everyone for allowing him to be in your homes every night for two decades. And I want to thank you for honoring his memory. Kim, thank you so much for being here, and Rob, you as well. And to Beth, uh, Willan, thank you for pulling this together. Thank you, colleagues. Thank you, Supervisor Chavez. We now move on to item 4C, which is to adjourn in honor and memory of the people of Ukraine and the Ukrainian families who have lost loved ones during the Russian invasion. On February 24th, 2022, Russia began a full-scale invasion of Ukraine which has resulted in the loss of countless innocent lives. My heart goes out to the 41 million people of Ukraine and to the thousands of Ukraine immigrants who now live in Santa Clara County. We will adjourn our board meeting today in memory of those who have been killed and in honor of the families who have lost loved ones. I'm now turning to my colleagues to see if any of them wish to say a few words about this issue as well. Supervisor Chavez. Thank you, Mike, and thank you so much for raising that. And I, I do I do appreciate it because I, I think that as a community, this is our opportunity to really support those who are fighting for their, their own democracy. And I, I hope that we find many, many ways to support that community as they're going through the challenges that they are. Thank you, Supervisor Wasserman. Thank you, Vice President Ellenberg. Our invocator this morning just uh, reminded us about finding points of, of agreement. And it is enraging and heartbreaking that um, that, that was not the route that, that the Russian uh, leader decided to go. The, the loss is already tragic. And I'm, I worry that, that we're not near the end of this episode. I want to encourage folks here, if you're looking for a way to help, there are relief organizations uh, to which you can contribute money. Always be careful and, and vet where you're giving money. You can give goods. There are actually some shipping containers um, being sent. My office can share information about that. There's a drop-off place at the Addison Pentac Jewish Community Center in, um, in Los Gatos. And continuing to, to share the news and to spread truth and to make sure that misinformation doesn't define the day is, is critical. Thanks, uh, President Wasserman, for the opportunity. Thank you, Vice President. Supervisor Lee. Thank you, President Wasserman. Uh, as having lived in the receiving end of these most on rocket attacks when I was serving in Iraq, I certainly feel the pain that this, so many millions of Ukrainians are, are suffering right now. Uh, this war, unfortunately, is completely unjustified as we have seen with the humanitarian toll of close to 2 million people has now just become refugees leaving Ukraine. We have a strong tradition here in Santa Clara County to support those in need. And certainly we want to make sure that we have our refugees, uh, if they do need help here in Santa Clara County, we're definitely ready to help. In addition, uh, since we do have a um, uh, sister county relations. Uh, we are in the process of drafting a letter I'm going to present to you, President Wasserman, to uh, send in to basically pray for the peace uh, of returning uh, and hope that uh, 
that uh, common sense would return to this uh, madness. Uh, and we really need to get the ceasefire in there and uh, hopefully we could uh, do a little umph to our partners uh, in the other commission to hope that they could influence, give them influence to get this to stop. Thank you very much. Thank you, Supervisor Lee. Supervisor Smitty. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. At our most recent meeting of the Federal Affairs Advocacy Task Force, we had some preliminary discussion uh, of the topic and asked our county executive to uh, share some information with our board and the public when we get to the county executive's report later in our meeting. So I just want to call that out for folks who are interested and uh, say that um, we look forward to having some uh, report back from our county executive when we get to that item on the agenda. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor. And now please join me for a moment of silence in honor of the people of Ukraine. Thank you all very much. We're now going to move on to item 4D. This is to adjourn in memory of one of my very best friends, Dick Sparr. Dick was a Los Gatos journalist who passed away on Saturday, February 26, after battling a long illness. He was 72. Rather than norm be in our normal dress clothing, I went and found the shirt that I got when I knew Dick. This says hometown hero. And on the back, it says Los Gatos Weekly Times that he was the, excuse me, that he was the editor of. And Dick was certainly a hometown hero. Dick was the editor of the Los Gatos Weekly Times and the Saratoga News and the sports editor for the Los Gatos Saratoga, Campbell, Cupertino, Sunnyvale, and San Jose Weekly newspapers. He did that for almost 50 years before retiring at the end of 2016 as the edit editor of the Los Gatos Weekly Times for his last 15 years. Dick said, it seems like only yesterday when I was walking across the front lawn of Los Gatos High School during graduation ceremonies, my diploma in hand and my whole life in front of me. The 1967 Los Gatos High School graduate wrote in his final column, the next 50 years went by in a blur. Dick occasionally wrote humorous columns in tight prose and light and self-deprecating style, touching on subjects such as growing up on a TV diet of Sky King, Howdy Doody, and the Lone Ranger. The size and contents of his wife's handbag, being mistaken in 2018 for presidential candidate John McCain, and a dog named Curly. His columns were recognized with awards in statewide journalism competitions. He entered the field when John Baggerly whom Los Gatos' major league field is named after, gave him his first chance to get his first story printed in the old Los Gatos Times Observer. Dick considered this as his first real article in a real newspaper. He attended Fisher Middle School in Los Gatos where he took an interest in writing about sports and after graduating from Los Gatos High School, attended West Valley College where he became sports editor of the college newspaper. In the 1970s, he became a sports writer for the Milpitas Post, a paper in Concord, and later the Times Observer in Los Gatos. He also coached youth baseball for 20 years. He was a huge Giants fan. I was a Cincinnati Reds fan. And he just got such pleasure when I became coach of the Little League San Francisco Giants. And I had to put on San Francisco Giants clothing for each game. He just loved seeing me in Giants wear. He served as sports editor of the Los Gatos Weekly Times and its sister community weeklies during Silicon Valley community newspapers ownership by Metro newspapers, now known as weeklies, and the owner of the Los Gatton. He left more than a decade after the Weekly Times purchase 
by the owners of the San Jose Mercury News. In, 20, in 2008, Dick was honored as Grand Marshal of the Los Gatos Children's Christmas Holiday Parade. He also received multiple awards from the California Teachers Association and the San Francisco Peninsula Press Club for exemplifying excellence in journalism. Former Los Gatos High football coach Butch Catolico posted a tribute on Sunday saying that Dick was a great person, a writer, a coach, a father, and a grandfather. He was an original member of the Los Gatos High School Athletic Hall of Fame Committee, but most of all, he was a friend, not just to me, but to all the people, especially the athletes of Los Gatos High School. We have all lost a great advocate for the youth and the town of Los Gatos. Dick and I have been friends for the last 20 years. We went to a Giants game together and had a standing $1 bet each season regarding the Giants and the Reds rivalry. In addition to being an editor and managing people, he never failed to interview the head coach of every team in Los Gatos' league and wrote a detailed story about each and every team. While I didn't get to spend as much time as I would have liked with Dick, the time I did spend with him was of the utmost quality. Dick lived in Morgan Hill during his retirement is survived by his wife, Natalie, sons, Mike and Kevin, two granddaughters, stepdaughters, Lisa, Michelle and Kim, stepson, Doug, and 13 step grandchildren. For the last 12 years, he answered my calls. Hello, Mr. Supervisor. And I his, hello, Mr. Editor. I consider Dick Sparrow a best friend and I want to close by saying, rest in peace, Mr. Editor. On behalf of the County of Santa Clara, I extend to Dick's family, friends, and coworkers our sincere condolences. And now I'd like to recognize one of Dick's sons, Kevin, who's speaking on behalf of Dick's family members and friends attending this meeting. Kevin. Hello. Uh, thank you, President Wasserman. Um, on behalf of the Spar family and, of course, my dad, uh, I just want to say thank you for recognizing my father. Um, he was a very humble, and just modest man, and never, never wanted to be in the spotlight. Sorry, it's pretty fresh, um, but he certainly deserved it. Uh, in, in just a couple of days, he's had hundreds of people reach out. Um, from, you know, players on little league teams that he coached or, you know, employees that worked for him 40 years ago, um, who just wanted to say how he affected their life. So, uh, yeah, so thank, thank you very much, you know, the Board of Supervisors for recognizing my dad. It was really real special. Thank you, Kevin. Please give my love to everybody. Thank you. With that, we're gonna move on to item number five, which is commendations and proclamations. But I've, before I turn this over to Supervisor Lee and then Vice President Ellenberg, I would like to ask anyone who wishes to speak under public comment, which will come after commendations and proclamations to please register electronically so we can have an idea of how many people are interested in speaking during public comment, which is an opportunity to speak about anything not on today's agenda, but under the purview of the Board of Supervisors. Thank you. Supervisor Lee, I turn to you for the pro first proclamation. Thank you, President Wasserman. Today we are also declaring March 18th, 2022 as the Santa Clara Valley Transportation Authority Transit Drivers Appreciation Day right here in our county. I would like to recognize the efforts of VTA's 110 light rail operators and the 882 bus drivers who have ensured that all Santa Clara County residents and visitors can make it to where they need to go, no matter what challenges have been placed before them. I believe our VTA's general manager and CEO, Carolyn Gunnott, and light rail operator, Samranjit Singh, bus operators, Michelle Torres, Danny Kintara, Eric Schantz, 
and Freddie Farah have joined us to accept this proclamation on behalf of ETA's transit drivers. Transit operators have been constantly working directly with the community throughout the pandemic to ensure that those who rely on transit for essential trips like medical appointments and treatment, getting to work or school, or running basic errands such as getting food for themselves and their family members. This would be enough to celebrate as transit operators, but they don't just clock out at the end of the day. They regularly go above and beyond by using their skills and talents to make our community better. Michael Torres saw the need of a teenage rider and rallied his community to help raise funds to buy the young man the computer, new clothes, food, and provided a generous monetary donation to help keep, keep his family afloat. Eric Shantz, who once rode the VT8 Route 22, was able to overcome addiction and homelessness and now drives the Route 22 as a bus driver. He goes above and beyond every shift to make Route 22 welcoming for all passengers and uses experience to help others. Danny Kintara used his talent as a photographer to elevate the work of his colleagues by creating several tribute pieces honoring the work of the VTA's transit operators, which now hang in the Guadalupe Light Rail Yard, bringing pride to the VTA family. And Freddie Ferrer, who regularly donates upwards of 20 backpacks to students in need every year. These operators help make sure everyone in our community is seen and supported. And for that reason, I am proud to stand with my colleagues to proclaim Friday, March 18, 2022, the Santa Clara Valley Transportation Authority Transit Drivers Appreciation Day. Carolyn, Carolyn Gannott from the General Manager of the CEO of BTA is with us. Carolyn, would you like to say a few words with us, please? Thank you, Supervisor Lee. I just actually want to um, thank you all, the supervisors, President Wasserman, for honoring our operators. Um, you know, they are frontline workers. Um, they are so extremely valuable to us and to the agency and to the community. Um, as I really want to thank those operators who are here today, Michael, Danny, Eric, Freddie, and I think Larry's here. I'm not sure if Simranji Singh made it, but um, I want to thank them for coming today. Um, they are just here representing, um, they're a small group representing all of our operators, and I actually want to thank them for their service. Um, we're planning on doing our own tribute for our operators on March 18th, and we really do appreciate the support of the community as we do that. Um, we're going to be publicizing ways that um, our community can get involved to show their appreciation for our frontline workers on the 18th. Um, you know, at this time, um, their work, as well as everybody in the agency, uh, means a great deal to us as we build back from the pandemic and the devastating event on March, May 26th. Um, you know, progress is slowly being made. Um, our ridership is coming back at a, at a higher, rate, higher rate than most of the other Bay Area transit agencies. It's still slow, but it's coming back. Um, we're moving into a process of transforming our organizational culture and climate at VTA so our employees know they're valued and appreciated and that VTA is a supportive place to work. Um, we're actively recruiting more bus operators to fill open spots um, with training classes every four weeks over the next few months. So if you can, anybody, please spread the word. We are looking and we are hiring um, uh, new operators. Um, you know, it, during this time that's been so sort of rough, we have been working very closely with the county. We appreciate all that support as um, our employees are taking advantage of the benefits of grief counseling at our new counseling center that was open with the help of the county and uh, State Senator Dave Cortese. And that help is enabling us to make um, a lot of effects through this, ha you know, have some effects through this very tough uh, year and in, in, in our healing journey that's to come. Um, this recognition of our operators um, is really important. We hope that the community will continue to support our VTA operators and all our employees who are dedicated in serving Santa Clara County. I want to thank you all. I want to thank Supervisor Chavez and Supervisor Lee for being on our board, Supervisor Simidian, last year, all the time they devote to helping make the agency as good as it is. So um, I actually want to thank you for honoring these operators. Uh, they really do mean a, uh, a great deal to us. Thank you. Thank you. Now turn to Vice President Ellenberg. Thank you very much, President Wasserman. It is my honor to present this proclamation on behalf of the Board of Supervisors to honor the to honor Youth Arts Month. 
accepting the proclamation today will be Janice Lobo Sapiago from the Sap Sapiago, my apologies, from the Santa Clara County Youth Poet Laureate Program. The Santa Clara County, the Santa Clara Youth Poet Laureate Program is a partner of the National Youth Poet Laureate. The National Youth Poet Laureate Program's mission is to celebrate our nation's top youth poets who are committed to artistic excellence, civic engagement, and social justice. The Santa Clara County Youth Poet Laureate Program selected its first Youth Poet Laureate in 2021. The mission of the program is to serve as youth ambassadors for civic engagement, literary excellence, and social justice through literacy, arts, and youth expression with ongoing opportunities for performances and community collaborations. I love this work and love the recognition. I started writing poems myself uh, in seventh grade and still have the, the journals from my very first words. I, I think maybe I was my deepest and most reflective at 12 years old, but I have never stopped writing and am thrilled that we, that we continue to support and celebrate uh, youth and young poets and lift up their voices and their works. Uh, Janice, I would love to invite you to say a few words right now. Yes, thank you so much, Vice President Ellenberg. Thank you to the whole board. Um, thank you for uh, honoring the Youth Poet Laureate Program and uh, proclaiming Youth Arts Month. On behalf of the program and Poetry Center San Jose, the National Youth Poet Laureate Initiative, and a team of volunteer youth poets and adult poets, we are thankful to be seen and heard. And we hope that more people can turn to poetry in times of joy and the need for justice. Um, the board has supported our call to make more space for youth poets in many ways. So thank you all for that. Um, I hope it's okay. I'd love to take some time to just acknowledge some of the youth who make this happen. Um, there are four that I'll talk about. Um, uh, Sarah Mohammed, who attends the Harker School and is the National Scholastic Student Poet Program for the West, um, along with Sophia Smith, who attends Mountain View High School, has co-hosted with Sarah and co-led numerous events for youth for our county, and both emailed them, uh, both emailed me a week apart when I first became Poet Laureate, asking if they could be a part of this program. And so if it wasn't for them and their push, um, they had said that they really appreciate the push for or STEM in the county, and they also wish that they had more creative writing courses. So our program has kind of become their creative writing course. Um, and of course, uh, Vice President Ellenberg named Anukia, who is our inaugural Youth Poet Laureate and attends Saratoga High School. Um, Anuk has taught numerous poetry workshops to our youth in Juvenile Hall, and will be co-editing an anthology featuring currently and formerly incarcerated youth poets um, with the Hawkins Project, which is a social action arm of um, that also holds the International Congress of Youth Voices. And so she'll be co-editing with one of our youth poets from Juvenile Hall. And Anuk is also going to be attending Yale this fall. Um, and Mahadhar Aklilu, who is our Vice Youth Poet Laureate, is a senior at Lincoln High School, supports their theater department, is involved with the Teen Tech Center at Makla in downtown San Jose, and supports and writes um, for climate justice. And so Youth Arts Month really supports them, their stories, their struggles, and what it means to be a young person in the county today. Um, so thank you for supporting them, and I hope we can all make room for the voices we have yet to hear. Um, please keep them in mind as you serve, because I know I do. Uh, thank you so much. Janice, thank you so much. Thank you for, for calling out uh, other students. I'm going to give particular shout outs to Harker and Lincoln, <laughs> solely because I have kids who graduated from both of those those schools and I'm just I'm thrilled to see that this is is happening across our country uh, across our county and I hope that we'll find representation from every single high school across Santa Clara County. Thanks again so much. Thank you. I think if Vice President Ellenberg was writing poetry when she was 12, one could argue that she's Santa Clara County's honorary first <laughs> poet laureate. All right. Thank Don't know you. if I earned it, but but thank you. There we go. Janice, thank you very much. All right. We now turn on to turn to item number six, which is public comment. As I mentioned before, if you wish to speak on this item, you need to register electronically in order to do so and be recognized. We'll give 
number of people that wish to register another 10 to 15 seconds. Then we'll set the timer. If there's a slew of people afterwards, then we'll need to change the time on those people registering late. So given that, Jill, please start our timer for two minutes each. Thank you. Our first speaker is Jesse Katz. You'll have two minutes to speak. Timer will start when you begin speaking. Jesse, go ahead. If you're speaking, your mic is unmuted. Please try again. We'll come back. Our next speaker is Blair Beekman. You'll have two minutes to speak. Timer will start when you begin speaking. Hi, Blair Beekman here. Thanks for the meeting today. Happy March to everyone. Um, it's a sad time what's going on in the in the Ukraine at this time, and I wanted to uh, you know come to the meeting today and just kind of practice how to speak about this openly and publicly at public comment time. Uh, you had a federal federal uh, committee meeting last week, and you you talked about your suspension of the uh, possible suspension of the of the Moscow sister city program. San Jose is offering to end their own, uh, suspend their own sister city program with uh, a, a city in Russia at this time. Um, you know, for as much as I, I understand your moral position and wanting to take a stand on this issue, uh, I think it really also should be noted the importance of what local communities and what people at the local level can do uh, as our national governments are fighting. And it's really an important cause and an important purpose. And I'm part of why the sister city program was created in the first place to, to mitigate and lessen uh, as, as, our as our national governments are fighting. It's a way for local communities to help the situation. Susan Ellenberg very nicely stated at the beginning of the meeting, you know, we could have been working on ideas of peace for the future of Ukraine and asked Russia to do the same. They have not. They've chosen a, a way of war to work out these issues. I really hope we can really openly and constructively can still talk about the ideas of peace for the future of the Ukraine area and really concentrate our energy and focus on what exactly that can be. And I wish all of ourselves good luck how to really talk about that. That's how we end the current state of war. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker is Bobby. I'm unmuting you. You have two minutes to speak. Timer will start when you begin speaking. I have recently lost my baby, the most exciting thing in my life in the last few years. Now I have shingles for the ninth time since I've started my nursing career. I've had my sacrifices. My name is Bobby Ninkirk. I've worked in the emergency rooms throughout Santa Clara County as an experienced RN3 since 2018. I had to leave the state because I cannot pay for my bills. I found a position that does not conflict with my beliefs. I am free to practice my religion. I'm making a little bit of money in my role as a nurse so I can stop wondering where my next meal is gonna come from. It's super unfortunate I couldn't say see you later to some of my favorite leaders, workers, doctors. You took my job, you took my benefits from me. COVID made all of our lives harder. I've worked in the ER and a nursing home since 2008. I've always done what it takes. To find out the needs of the community, you have to listen to what's going on. I have been united with so many others under the sense of justice. Thank you for everything you do. Nobody knows everything. I know we're not sitting around a large table discussing this, but you need to right old wrongs, put an end to this religious discrimination, reinstate your staff, Many of us have been on, on unpaid leave for the last four months. Finally, after working the last month, I'm starting to remember why I like serving the community. I'm starting to feel peace, even with everything going on. And so I just hope that you really listen and hear us. Thank you. Next speaker is Nanette Salazar. You'll have two minutes to speak. Timer will start when you begin speaking. Hi, my name is Nanette Salazar. I have proudly worked for VMC as a radiologic technologist for some 29 years. I'm a clinical instructor, 
tasked with training future technologists and coworkers. I am here talking to you because I believe our patients deserve better. They deserve the same quality of care as anyone else in the Bay Area. Also, my coworkers deserve to be proud of where they work. The main issue I would like to bring to your attention in radiology is staffing. Our hiring practices cannot keep up with our attrition. We have worked severely short staffed for over two years. We are physically and mentally exhausted. We're sacrificing breaks and lunches for our patients. We're making more mistakes. We're suffering from acute injuries and chronic pain, and we have completely thrown off our work-life balance. Our patients are suffering as well. They are sick, they are tired, they are anxious. Many must wait in our waiting rooms and in the emergency department upwards of two hours or more to be seen. Patient surgeries are being delayed, life-saving stat exams are being delayed. I want the Board of Supervisors to please don't just take my word for it. Come and visit our department, come and talk to our employees and patients, put yourself in their shoes for one day. I don't know how we got here, but you can make a difference. Thank you for this opportunity to speak. Thank you. Next speaker is Sue Fritz. You'll have two minutes to speak. Timer will start when you begin speaking. Sue, if you could unmute, please. Sorry. Thank you, supervisors. I appreciate your time. My name is Sue Fritz, and I've come to speak with you not only as a proud employee of VMC radiology department for the past 23 years, but also as a concerned citizen of Santa Clara County and a current patient of VMC. Of those years, I've spent the past 20 in interventional radiology. The main issues I would like to address are staffing and equipment. I am here today to bring your attention to the effect our staffing shortage and lack of work equipment, working equipment has on our patient care. We are dangerously understaffed and some of our equipment has been broken down for more than two years. Our responsibility is to give the best health care we can to our community. We are failing miserably. Not only are we delaying care to our customers on a daily basis, but we are also losing capital due to the fact that we have to send those patients elsewhere to get the care that they need. I come to you with the weight of the patient cares on my heart. I ask you to invest new, in new equipment and vital human resources. The health and welfare of our community, as well as the revenue of Santa Clara County Health and hospital systems now depends on your actions. Thank you so much. Thank you. Next speaker is Dalila Polito. You'll have two minutes to speak. Timer will start when you begin speaking. Hi, yesterday I spoke at the meeting and stated that all the workers who were deemed high risk and put on unpaid leave due to the vaccine uh, mandates needed to be reinstated. I was directed to look at the new health order and informed that those workers deemed high risk were now able to work in high risk settings. But I want my question answered, are all the workers that were placed on unpaid leave going to be reinstated? I don't think it's fair to keep them in limbo. The stress and hardship that these workers have been through is horrible. These workers have been in limbo long enough. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker is Edward Strine. You'll have two minutes to speak. Timer will start when you begin speaking. Yeah, just uh, want to say that uh, Dr. Uh, Rand Paula had already uh, proved that uh, Fauci had funded the Wuhan lab and uh, he should be in a military prison for what he's done to our country. Uh, he first said that uh, people should not uh, wear masks and then he tells other people that, yeah, now it's time to wear masks. Um, and then you've got doctors saying ivermectin, hydroxychloroquine is the way to go. And then uh, we've got people uh, saying, uh, no, you know, a vaccine is the only way to go. And uh, it's all about big money. And uh, you've destroyed a lot of people's lives for following uh, these uh, uh, mandates uh, and, and enforcing these mandates on people. It's, it's, it's criminal what you guys have done. Thank you very much. Next speaker is Alan. Kamara, you'll have two minutes to speak. Timer will start when you begin speaking. 
Ellen, if you could please unmute. Please go ahead. Go ahead, Ellen. Um, yeah, good morning, auto supervisors. Um, this is Alan Kamara from IMPA. Um, what a journey we've been in, right? Um, thank God now we are we are back to hopefully some resemblance of normalcy. Um, I'm here speaking on behalf of our many, many nurses, firefighters, sheriff department, and a lot of the county employees who are sitting at home, who have medical and religious exemption, but we refuse accommodation. So today, we want to thank the Board of Supervisors for pushing hard um, so we can align with the, the rest of the state. Santa Clara County, at least in my understanding, is the only one that wasn't able to accommodate people for their religious exemptions and medical, some of the medical stuff, some of that. So we want to thank you that we're here now and we are urging the Board of Supervisors pleading to you to ask the county uh, staff to meet with the respective unions so we can get the staff back to work. As you've heard all the staff, some of whom are former staff, we are failing with having patients waiting in our waiting rooms for hours and hours on end because we don't have staff. And but we have these nurses who can come back and help us. So supervisors, thank you for all your help to all the staff who are outside waiting to come back to work. We empathize with you, Bobby. Thank you for the eloquent statement. Um, we empathize with you. We look forward to meeting with labor relations so we can get our nurse back to work as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. Next speaker is Jess Katz. I'm unmuting you. You'll have two minutes to speak. Timer will start when you begin speaking. Jess, if you could please unmute. Hello, Go ahead. my name is Jess. Hello, my name is Jesse Katz, and I'm contacting you about uh, our attempts by Santa Clara County to seize our family farm over actions that were taken during the Loma fire emergency and alleged code violations that arose out of actions that we took during the Loma fire emergency. My brother and I have worked as wildfire contractors, volunteer firefighters. I sit on the board of the Santa Clara Santa Clara Fire Safe Council, although I'm here in my individual capacity today to appeal the board, to appeal to the board, to look into the malfeasance and misconduct of county council, county staff, Wasserman, you, you have been directly involved in this and, and this fraud that Santa Clara County is attempting to perpetrate on us in order to seize our family farm. There are no code violations on this property. We've been refused due process. You have falsified evidence and we have been accused of crimes for documenting this misconduct by recording county officers, including county council and county staff. And instead of addressing this misconduct, county council is attempting to criminalize so the way that I have obtained this evidence of your criminal misconduct. I urge the county supervisors to look into this liability that the county is creating for itself. And, I, and I, I'm here to tell you that we will be holding bad actors legally accountable. I want to be clear that this is not any kind of threat that anyone should take personally, but there will be legal consequences for the harm that we've been, that we've been caused and the damages that we've been incurred. Thank you. Next speaker is Irvish Kumar Mehta. You'll have two minutes to speak. Tamar will start when you begin speaking. Thank you very much to Board of Supervisor for the gaining the opportunity to speak as a public speaker. Uh, I wanted to uh, emphasize on uh, County of Santa Clara's interfacing with the with the world of the technology. Uh, nevertheless, you know we are as you know we are going through. Uh, a phase of a COVID-19 Ukraine situation, Afghanistan repatriation, which is important to, to mention about that, you know, how the technology evolves and that what improvements and enhancement that is to be required to be made in terms of fraudulent activities or identity theft. I'm talking about the times when uh, 
when the financial uh, operations within the government and the financial operations were managed through the financial transaction protocols of a financial system, and that's, that, system, that system was compromised uh, with the data accuracies not maintained and as well as the, the standards and the compliance not maintained by the government operations and the legitimacy of that data gets into the question we have to we have to remind us of the different institution that you know we work with and as well as a Fed, federal bureau of agencies of a james hudger uh, the late james uh, hoover who has established the agencies who has pioneered the efforts in order to capture those individuals that who performs these actions and i request the uh, board of supervisor and county of santa Fe to emphasize on that you know how technology could change the uh, platforms and as well as how the policy shaping within the technology could help reshaping the technology within the county of Santa Clara. For example, the cyber crimes and cyber criminal activities are the most uh, fraud the way to, fraud, to, 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 pre to prevent the fraud and as well as identity theft within the county of Santa Clara. Thank you very much for your considerations of comments. Thank you. And that concludes our request to speak, Mr. President. And thank you, Jill. I appreciate that. That concludes item number six on our agenda. We now turn to item number seven, which is approval of the consent calendar and changes to our agenda. Jill, would you please read the posted consent calendar update? We have a request from Supervisor Simidian to add item numbers 11 and 12 to the consent calendar. Item number 11, approve referral to administration to send a letter of support for the authorization for the construction and operation of a veteran's home in Fort Ord, California, to serve elderly and disabled veterans of Monterey County and the Greater Bay Area. Item number 12 is to approve referral to County Council to work in partnership with the Office of the District Attorney and report to the board on April 19, 2022, with options for consideration relating to an ordinance which would prohibit the possession, manufacturing, and assembly of a ghost gun within County of Santa Clara jurisdiction. We have a request from Vice President Ellenberg and Supervisor Simidian to add item number 14 to the consent calendar. Item number 14 is to approve county sponsorship of Sunnyville Historical Society and Museum Association in the amount of $3,000 from the Supervisorial District 3 allocation and the Office of the Clerk of the Board fiscal year 2021 to 2022 budget to support the A Walk Through Time event. We have a request from Supervisor Simidian to add item number 17 to the consent calendar. Item number 17 is to consider recommendations relating to the creation of a Board of Supervisors policy and acting a local voters right act policy in Santa Clara County. We have a request from Vice President Ellenberg to add item numbers 21 and 22 to the consent calendar. Item number 21 is to receive report relating to the reissued request for proposal for consulting services to develop an Office of Disability Affairs and Advisory Board. Item number 22 is to receive report relating to staff support for the Santa Clara County Fentanyl Working Group. We have a request from President Wasserman to add item numbers 24 and 25 to the consent calendar. Item number 24 is to approve request for appropriation modification number 173, $750,224 transferring funds from the General Fund Contingency Reserve to the Office of the Sheriff Budget relating to adding 43 positions for the access to health care staff plan in jail facilities. Item number 25 is adoption of salary ordinance number NS-5.22.100 adding 43 sheriff's correctional deputy or correctional officer positions in sheriff DOC contract. We have a request from administration to hold item numbers 26, 27, and 28 to March 22, 2022. Item number 26 is to receive report relating to the micro business grant program. Item number 27 is to receive report relating to a collaborative motel placement program. Item number 28, approve agreement with Young Women's Freedom Center relating to providing life coaches with lived experience in human trafficking in an amount not to exceed $676,384 for period December 15, 2021 through December 31, 2022. 
We have a request from administration to hold item number 29 to the budget hearing in June 2022. Item 29 is to receive a report relating to a status update on the Small Business Resiliency Grant Program. And that concludes the consent calendar update. Thank you, Jill. I appreciate that. I would also like to propose adding items 19 and 23 to the consent calendar. Uh, 19 is under advisement from October 19, 2021. Receive report from the Office of Supportive Housing relating to the status of All the Way Home campaign. And 23 is also held from the February 15th meeting. Receive report from the Office of the District Attorney relating to Intimate Partner Violence Strangulation Response Program. Supervisor Lee, I see your hand raised first, then Vice President Ellenberg. Uh, thank you, President Wasserman. I just would like to actually add 24 and 25 back to the agenda, uh, not to be placed on the consent. Thank you. You want to have 24 and 25 held? Yes. I mean, heard. Uh, no, to be heard. heard. Yeah, correct. Yes. Thank you. And that's it. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Vice President Ellenberg. Supervisor Wasserman, did you just recommend moving? I'm sorry, I didn't hear clearly. Item 23. To consent? Yes. I'd, I'd actually like to hear that if you don't mind. I have a few questions uh, uh, on the item. And I just want to make a, a brief comment on item 38, uh, leaving it on consent. This is to approve an F85 appropriation modification to transfer $2 million from the child care reserve to the ESA budget regarding our child care assistance pilot program. I, I want to highlight the occasion knowing uh, that one, this was one of my very first referrals when I joined the board in 2019. And, and of course, several of my colleagues and even predecessors on the board had requested this uh, type of program for our employees in the past. We definitely know that childcare is one of, has been one of the biggest barriers to employees returning to work. This type of, of subsidy assistance is really essential. I want to thank administration for getting the pilot up and running. I'm looking forward to seeing the results of the program and hearing from our employees that do participate in the pilot. So more to come. Thank you very much. Thank you, Vice President. Supervisor Simidian. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, what I would like to do is just ask uh, that the clerk record me as an abstention on item number 50, abstain on item 50, and a no vote on item 93. Uh, that's uh, again, a no vote on item 93. Thank you very much. Thank you, Supervisor Chavez. Thank you. Um, I, I uh, just to, to make sure I'm clear, uh, Supervisor Wasserman, you asked yes. that 19 be put on consent? Yes. Thank you, I'm gonna come, I'll come back to that. So um, uh, Supervisor uh, Wasserman, you'll be thrilled to hear that I'm not taking any items off consent. There are some I'm going to comment on. Um, um, item 12 is a ghost gun ordinance referral from myself and Supervisor Lee. Um, and this referral's intent is to increase public safety and further address firearms and violence. Um, it has four steps to it that would allow us to look specifically at ghost guns where we're not preempted by other, um, by state or federal law. I, I just wanted colleagues that um, we're not getting a presentation on this, but I wanted to just acknowledge that in 2015, the crime lab examined four ghost guns and six years later, they examined 293 of them as, you know, during um, reviews of uh, criminal activity. Um, I also just wanted to acknowledge that this was taken up by the Hate Prevention and Inclusion Task Force because there's national research that demonstrates that um, for many hate crimes, ghost guns are the tools uh, that are being used to, to um, frighten and alarm and alert and harm and kill people. So um, I'm excited to be working on this with Supervisor Lee and also with the District Attorney's Office. Um, on item 17, this is in response to a referral that, that Senator Cortese and I brought forward in April of 2020, following recommendations from the voter suppression and engagement hearing that we held in 2019. Our goal was to create a, loader, a local voter rights act to make 
voting a cultural norm in Santa Clara County and make sure that all of those eligible to vote are informed and can do those without barriers. I really wanted to thank Shannon and, the, and her whole team at the Registrar of Voters and County Council for working on this policy. I would like to make sure that there is one additional direction given, and that is to ask the ROV to formally include in its work plan the outreach materials and flyers that go into all countywide departments as they become available so folks can be proactive in sharing this information, just given our broad reach in the community. Item 21 is a report relating to the consulting services to develop an Office of Disability Affairs. I again want to thank staff for their report. I'm encouraged to see that they've identified a partner to conduct the state stakeholder engagement. I would like to request that staff send the board an off agenda off agenda the contract with World Institute on Disability once it's signed, a detailed work plan for the stakeholder engagement sessions, and an update relating to the anti-ableism training that they are working on. Item 38 is an appropriation that, that Supervisor Ellenberg so um, eloquently pulled out, and I am okay with leaving this on consent, but I just wanted to chime in with Supervisor Ellenberg at how important this um, body of work is, and that I do look forward to coming back with Supervisor Ellenberg on an expansion strategy for child care services. Item 22, I, for the Fentanyl Working Group, I wanted to thank staff for the quick response. This is obviously an emergency and very much appreciate them weighing in. I will be registering a no vote on item 79 regarding the jail construction in a manner, and this is my request for staff, that's consistent with my vote on this item when we held it on the broader discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Vice President Ellenberg. Your hand is still up. It is, uh, President Wasserman, uh, with apologies, there was an additional comment uh, that I wanted to uh, make on consent. I don't need to pull it off, but it's regarding 47. And um, before I do that, I want to also register a no vote on 79 with appreciation to Supervisor Chavez for calling that out uh, so that I'm also consistent with my no vote on the jail. Uh, with regard to item 47, I want to just first extend a quick thanks to the civil grand jury and the Department of Tax and Collections for their for their work. DTAC has been really responsive and I think uh, continues to improve our property tax bills for sure. Transparency is, imp is important and I'd like to provide um, a, a, one additional element of, of a direction to staff to incorporate into the long-term work plan. Wherever we have the information available, we should be adding the end date for each bond measure. I understand that at the outset, we don't always know what the end date will be, but when it's available, that should be included. And the total amount collected across the county uh, for each tax line item is a, is a piece of information that we have been asked uh, numerous times uh, by constituents to lift up for inclusion. And I understand that this could take some time uh, to update our systems, but as we are in this continuous improvement mode, uh, I'd like to see these, these two elements included as well. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Supervisor Chavez, your hand is still raised. Thank you. I apologize. Um, when you put item 19 on consent, it just reminded me that I that there was one thing I wanted to point out. I wanted to just acknowledge the staff and the partnership. It's pretty amazing, really. And I think um, we spend so so much time here focusing on problems that we don't often just say to our staff, well done. Um, I want to acknowledge that over 2,000 veterans have been housed, which is really amazing. I mean, that's an amazing number. I, I also recognize that we continue to have many, many veterans fall into homelessness and that we're, we have to keep building units as quickly as possible. I just want to also acknowledge that one body of work that I'll look very forward to um, learning more about is what we can do on the prevention side. Um, the continued prevention to really support veterans from becoming homeless in the first place. But staff, I didn't want you to think that we didn't see the amazing work that you've done. Thank you. Thank you. And with that, Jill, a couple of things for myself, please register a no vote on 93, which was the redistricting issue. And also, Jill, if I can just go through this quickly to make sure that we have all the supervisors and I have it correctly. 
The consent items now are 11, 12, 17, 19, 21, 22, and held are 26, 27, 28, and 29. Is that what you show, Jill? Yes, did you mention 14, Mr. President, for consent? Uh, no, I did not. I have it noted here, but I didn't mention it. 14, thank you. Thank you. Okay, and with that, let's turn to public speakers, give them two minutes each for um, any comments they have regarding the consent calendar. Our first speaker is Blair Beekman. You'll have two minutes to speak. Timer will start when you begin speaking. Hi, Blair Beekman. Uh, to speak on item uh, 49, which is about, uh, I don't know if I have the uh, right intention or the right idea with this, but it, it's a, uh, a final grand jury report about technology services and solutions. Have lessons been learned? What exactly are the lessons learned for this uh, grand jury final report? I hope I can read into that more in, in the future. Uh, I, I'm interested in how you know the future of technology and the surveillance technology ordinance can be a really hopeful, useful tool for ourselves and, and to define the ideas of uh, openness, accountability, peace, democracy, all the good stuff. I think it can really be of help with the uh, issues in Ukraine basically right now. It can be of help, the person, a uh, public comment earlier spoke of cybersecurity needs uh, to make cybersecurity open and accessible, to have a series of guidelines that we used to work on here at Santa Clara County available to the public and understandable how the public can ask questions about cybersecurity, that's an important function. And I just wanted to remind yourselves of that. And a final reminder that it's the work of the Technology Surveillance Ordinance that is, um, it, it really works on the local level. It asks each local community to come up with their own good ideas of what can be civil protections, civil rights, good community uh, participation, um, that's kind of what the uh, invocation was about today. It was about how do we make things continue to keep things local? And it's that locality that can really help uh, to, to deal with national issues. It, it provides a check and balance for national issues when they're on one end at the local level. It's the care that we can bring at the local level. And it's good thinking that we always want to offer each other that's it's important at this time. Thank you. Thank that you. concludes our request to speak. Thank you very much. So I need a motion to approve the consent calendar. So much. Uh, second, Thank with you. all, if I could, with all comments made by board members. Yes, with all comments made by board members, absolutely. So motion by Vice President Ellenberg, second by Supervisor Chavez. Seeing no other hands. Jill, a uh, roll call vote, please. Supervisor Lee. Aye. Supervisor Chavez. Yes. Supervisor Simidian. Aye. Vice President Allenberg. Yes. And President Wasserman. Yes. Thank you. Item eight, of course, is our um, public health officer going to join us after lunch at one o'clock. We move on to item number nine, uh, approve referral to the office of the district attorney. And let me just turn my page over here. And we turn to Supervisor Chavez for this referral. Thank you, colleagues. I'm bringing this referral forward in collaboration with the Office of the District Attorney because we were prompted by the situation in San Francisco where their police department allegedly used a database with DNA collected from victims of sexual assault to connect them to some, try to connect them to, to crimes. What this referral asks is that the Office of the District Attorney to report back to the board on April 19th with first information regarding current crime lab policies, protocols, and practices relating to the DNA profiles of sexual assault survivors. And second, with recommendations, if any, to further strengthen existing processes to ensure that sexual assault survivor DNA profiles are not used to incriminate survivors by connecting them with crimes. The Office of the District Attorney shared that our county does not, does not repeat, does not use the crime lab's in-house database to search survivors' DNA profiles or ever use them to prosecute survivors for other alleged crimes. 
I'm asking for a public discussion about this because I wanna make sure that survivors know that they can be safe in coming forward and getting help, including a sexual assault forensic exam. And in addition to that, wanna make sure that all of our policies, procedures, and protocols are, are, um, are positioned in a way that makes it difficult or impossible for them to be changed without a robust public discussion at any time in the future. I would appreciate my colleagues' support. Thank you. Is that a motion? So moved. A second. Do I have a second by Supervisor Lee? Uh, we have one speaker, Jill. Please let that person speak, and then we'll come back to the board for a vote. Our first speaker is Irvish. I'm unmuting you. You'll have two minutes to speak. Timer will start when you begin speaking. Thank you very much to uh, Board of Supervisors for the opportunity to speak regarding the item, uh, agenda item number nine. We are very much in, in the era where uh, where any particular crime is being connected. We rather need not to be wait for either a public defender or district attorney's office or uh, or a justice department office to be referred to uh, to be referred to any any specifications to be collected under the sexual assault uh, survivors cases. We are in the era of a technology where the DNA profiles and the DNA data collections can be directly made through the technology and as well as such victims and survivors also be, uh, be, uh, also be safeguarded and the right set of policies be, be provided to them such that you know, they be cured as well as they be provided the right set of assistant education and resources on uh, getting understanding of that, you know, what it is to what it is to undergo a procedure of a DNA profiling and as well as ensuring that, you know, when they, when any such data is being collected, how their data privacies and identity are, identities are being protected by the, gov by the government. Also to ensure that there are technology providers out there within the Silicon Valley, which just, a, which does a DNA profile, which does a DNA profiling and as well as collect the data at the time of the incident as well. It is important that, this put in on such survivors and victims cases this data be collected at the right set of a time in order to connect them with the crimes and also to make sure that you know that data be protected with the in incident when the when the incident had happened if the specimen is not collected within the specific amount of time then there is no point of data being collected so ensuring that the policies are being placed that the victim and survivors are being protected and such that the dna profiling data are so important that that the governance be enabled to protect their identity as well and provide them the education resources. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker is Blair Beekman. You'll have two minutes to speak, Tamara. We'll start when you begin speaking. All right, thank you for the words of the previous speaker. Um, you know, this item was first brought out in San Francisco, I think just a few weeks ago, and already you guys are talking about it and, and making a point about it, and thank you very much for that. You're getting it out in the open. That is so first and foremost that we're, we're talking about it. Thank you. I think, you know, that we're with our surveillance and technology ordinance ideas, we have much better guidelines how to better talk about this issue and what exactly, what civil protections are being violated with this. And it's more easier and clear, more clear to understand what exactly we need to do at this time, I think. Uh, thank you. Uh, we're, we're doing it. We're working on this very quickly. Uh, I very much recommend uh, the city of Oakland. They have a commission called the uh, Privacy Advisory Commission. Uh, and they, they, all they do is work on stuff like this. They receive information about this. They study it and give reports about it and try to give a, a interpretations that, that best promote the ideas of uh, civil rights and civil protections. Of, of everyday community and everyday neighborhoods. And um, I, I recommend you you look into their work. They were talking about this a few weeks ago and they, they're always on this doing this kind of work for the city of Oakland. Uh, this, it's their job as a commission process. Uh, please look into their work. Uh, they can really help with recommendations and, and a guideline structure uh, for, for what we need to be working on and, and what we can do better uh, for our future of technology, its openness and its accountability. If we work on those things, I mean, those are the ideas of peace and sustainability for our future, I believe. I think it can help lead us in an amazing good direction for our future. Good luck in these work, this work and effort, and uh, thank you for your time. That concludes our request to speak.
Thank you. We certainly want to move in an amazing and good direction. That'd be a good motto right there for sure. Okay, I'm certainly in support. We have Supervisor Simidian who wishes to speak. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I just wonder if the maker and the seconder would be amenable to a friendly amendment, <coughs> including the uh, public defender and OCLAM in this effort as well. Supervisor Chavez? Um, yeah, I, I think I think that's fine. I'm not sure exactly what the the roles would be, but you know, I think the more the merrier. <laughs> it's always good to have smart people around the table. Thank you. I, I, I thought the public defender in particular, given the concern about making sure that the uh, uh, that any quote evidence uh, obtained not be used in this way uh, might be a particularly helpful resource. So thank you for that. Yeah, that's good feedback. Thank you, Joe. Super, thank you. All right, with that, we have a motion. We have a second. Supervisor Lee, you were uh, amiable to that as well? Yes, certainly. Okay, wonderful. Joe, with that, oops, who has submitting in your hand? Nope, down. Jill, roll call vote, please. Supervisor Lee. Aye. Supervisor Chavez. Yes. Supervisor Simidian? Aye. Vice President Ellenberg? Yes. President Wasserman? Yes, as well. Thank you. I'm going to go to my gallery view so that I can see all 25 faces instead of just the person speaking and a couple more on the side. All right, that concluded item number nine. We now move on to item number 10, which is to consider recommendations relating to actions that will sustain the Eastridge Little League for the next five years. Supervisor Chavez, you brought this forward? Yes, thank you very much. Um, item 10, colleagues, is a referral seeking support for necessary action to sustain Eastridge Little League for the next five years. Um, President Wasserman, I'm gonna run through my, my um, just framework of this and I'll make comments after, but just so folks know what it is that we're discussing. My goal is to ensure the kids in East San Jose have a clean and safe place to play baseball away from the flight path of small planes using toxic leaded fuel. Before diving in, I want to thank the City of San Jose and the Health Trust for agreeing to be partners, in particular Council Members Arenas and uh, Carrasco, and to the Eastridge Little League and their volunteer group of board members and coaches, I'm so grateful for their commitment to the League and the children of East San Jose. As you know, beginning March 28th, the league can no longer use the fields at Reed Hill View due to the ongoing lead issues. Given the urgency of the situation, my referral asks for the administration to return to the Board of Supervisors on March 22nd with the following information. First, a contract with the City of San Jose for an amount not to exceed 500,000 over a period of five years for costs associated with field rentals um, and uh, umpires and the rest so the league can continue to play at other local uh, locations. B, a contract with the city of San Jose for an amount not to exceed a million dollars for the period of five years for costs associated with field improvements for Capitol Welch, Hillview Parks, and potentially a high school location. Item C, funding the options for the county for a, an amount not to exceed 350,000 for a period of five years to maintain the affordability of access and accessibility and operations for the league. Item D, a contract with the Health Trust to cover administrative costs to serve as a fiscal sponsor for the league. And E, a report for the creation of a working group with partners from the county, the city of San Jose, Eastridge Little League, and the Health Trust to identify mid and long-term strategies for the league, including a timeline for report back to the board um, no later than three, three years so that the board can take into account where we are um, addressing the availability of fields, particularly at Reed Hill View. These numbers may not be the exact ones we're, we're bringing forward, but they were informed by many meetings with Eastridge Little League, the City of San Jose, and the Health Trust. And I'm very excited for the staff report and really appreciate everyone working so quickly to help the Little League in this, these really extenuating circumstances. With that, I'd like to hear from the public and with, I would, I'll make a motion um, and then I'd like to hear from the public. And I'll second for purposes of discussion uh, with a possible friendly amendment after we hear from the public, Mr. Chair. Thank you. And with that, we will turn to the public 
And um, I'm going to go two minutes each now, unless the number swells up, then we'll go to one. Um, let's go with two minutes each, Jill, for now, please. Our first speaker is Linda Quack. I'm unmuting you. You'll have two minutes to speak. Timer will start when you begin speaking. Linda, if you could unmute, please. Please go ahead. My name is Linda Quack, MRI technologist at VNC for 17 years. Let us take a moment to imagine you are taking a tour into radiology department. You learn that equipment end of life is between 10 to 15 years. Yet, four out of six X-ray machines and one of the two MRI machines are 23 years old. You see that there aren't the latest 3D mammography machines to detect early breast cancer. You notice one of the CT machines have been down since August 2020. Also, you, excuse, you see, me, excuse me, Linda, Jill, if you can stop her time for a minute. Linda, we're on item number 10, dealing with the Eastridge Little League. Oh, sorry. So you'd, you'd need to speak on that item. Thank you. Sorry about that. Okay, next speaker, please. Our next speaker is Gabriel. I'm unmuting you. You'll have two minutes to speak. Timer will start when you begin speaking. Uh, hey, I hope you can hear me okay. Yes. Uh, this is Gabriel Hernandez, um, the director for the CISA Puede Collective. We've actually had families contact us about um, the Little League being moved or what's going to happen and, you know, all those types of things. And so this is uh, such an amazing um, development. Um, I know between, you know, the, uh, Supervisor Chavez's office and, uh, and uh, the City of San Jose and the Health Trust that that partnership is going to work out. And you have to know that I'm speaking with reluctance because I'm a soccer guy, not a baseball guy, but this is the right thing to do. And so we're asking that you all um, support uh, these uh, proposals. And if there's anything that we can do to help support that, um, you know, we're there to help out. So thank you all very much. Our next speaker is Michelle Liu. I'm unmuting you. You'll have two minutes to speak. Timer will start when you begin speaking. Good morning, Michelle Liu, CEO of the Health Trust, and we also encourage your I vote on item 10 today. As you might know, the Health Trust, through our subsidiary FAS, Financial Administrative Support Services, provides comprehensive accounting services for about 80 nonprofits. We're honored to provide financial support services for Eastridge Little League. Coach Rich, who's the Vice President of Eastridge, happens to work at the Health Trust. And it turns out our FAS CEO himself is a 30 plus year little league coach. As Coach Rich would say, let's hit it out of the park. Let's work together to ensure a safe place for Eastridge youth to play baseball. We're glad to be part of the solution and we thank you. Our next speaker is Vince Rivero. I'm unmuting you. You'll have two minutes to speak. Timer will start when you begin speaking. Hi, actually, this is Javier Campos. Um, it's a long story on my Zoom. So, so please, please uh, mark me down as Javier Campos. Um, uh, members of the Board of Supervisors, um, I'm, I'm reaching out to you as a, a longtime East San Jose community member, a former council member in that district, and a former coach for Eastridge Little League. Um, at you, as you will be hearing in this discussion, Eastridge Little League has been part of our spring baseball traditions. Like clockwork during the last weekend of March, you will see a parade that will go down our streets. Um, Eastridge Little League uh, was and, and still is a strong feeder into Overfelt High School's junior varsity and varsity baseball programs. In fact, if you look at Overfelt's rich baseball traditions, you'll see many of those kids learn how to play baseball at Eastridge Little League. We are grateful to Supervisor Chavez's leadership and the city of San Jose uh, also coming together with the county to create this opportunity. Um, we urge you to support this. This is very important to keep our kids safe. As, as, as you've heard in the reports uh, regarding lead exposure, we need to make sure our kids are safe and have a safe place to, to play. Thank you very much for your time. 
Next speaker is Myra. I'm unmuting you. You'll have two minutes to speak. Can you hear me now? Please go ahead. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Mera Pelagio, Bernanchi Hercella with Latinos United for New America. And I want to express my support for Supervisor Chavez's referral on item 10 and consider recommendations relating to actions that will sustain the East Ridge Little League for the next five years. We must continue to protect our youth from harmful lead exposure, given the results of the airborne lead study of last August. There's a lot of uncertainty now on whether the community living under the flight path and areas surrounding the airport are still at risk of lead contamination. The county has the wonderful opportunity to support children in East San Jose in having the opportunity to be outdoors, exercise, and develop, develop a healthy lifestyle, all without risking exposure to lead pollution. We are grateful to the city of San Jose, uh, who has agreed to partner in efforts to ensure that East Ridge Little League has the resources and infrastructure needed to continue to operate and have kids play ball in safer and cleaner locations. I urge you to support Supervisor Chavez's referral and I thank her for her leadership. Thank you so much. Next speaker is Stephen McHenry. I'm unmuting you, you'll have two minutes to speak. Thank you. <clears throat> I would actually urge the county to reverse the fundamental decision that resulted in this item and the spending of more than $1.8 million of taxpayer money when the more prudent thing to do would be simply allow the East Ridge Little League to remain in their current location. The county has used misinformation and disinformation about the degree of the lead problem, especially since the transition to unleaded fuel to justify this move. A detailed analysis of how the public has been misled can be found at tinyurl.com slash SCC lead study. It will be clear after understanding that content that this is a completely needless move of the Little League. According to the lead study, the transition to unleaded fuel at the airport means that at the moment, it is no more dangerous to be near the airport than it is to be further away from the airport. To be clear, we fully support the Little League and believe they should continue to play in their current entirely safe location. Thank you. Next speaker is Huascar Castro. I'm unmuting you. You'll have two minutes to speak. Hello, can you hear me? Please go ahead. Thank you very much. My name is Huascar Castro with Working Partnerships USA. Um, I'm proud to stand alongside coalition members to support this referral today put forth by Supervisor Chavez. Um, I want to thank the supervisor uh, as well as partners within the city of San Jose and the Health Trust for working to find a safe space for a positive outlets such like such as Easter's Little League to continue to operate elsewhere. Um, you know, throughout our conversation around this campaign in 2021, we have um, a lead study to put together by lead epidemiologists that are showing that um, folks that are living near or are near the airport are at serious risk of lead exposure. We need to take that into account and take our youth safety into account and figure out how we can better allow our youth to flourish, participate in important programs such as Little League and positive outlets. Uh, in a safe manner. So we'd like to thank all our partners for their leadership on this issue. And we urge the rest of the board to put an I vote for this referral. Thank you very much. Next speaker is Victor Vasquez. I'm unmuting you. You'll have two minutes to speak. Please go ahead. Good morning. Thank you so much for the opportunity to put our youth and family safety first. We're strongly supporting um, Supervisor Chavez's recommendation. And, you know, I. I know there's a lot of um, misinformation that's also being put out there, but you know the the studies are are clear that no amount of lead is safe for anyone, for our families, for the little league players, and also in addition, I think that um, these are the right steps to make sure that not only they have a safe place for uh, to play, but also that we support organizations like the little little league to. Uh, find um, additional funding and other parks that better suit the, the playing conditions that they deserve. Um, ultimately, it's also a positive step because um, the new vision for this place should benefit all players, including the Little League and the surrounding neighborhood, in addition to the economic uh, benefits that it should bring to the community, not just a selected few 
um, but the overall community. If we remember back some of the visioning sessions that people talked about, they talked about sports, space, place for sports, a place for youth development, a place to potentially uplift the, the heritage of our local indigenous nations and local east side heroes. Again, job development. So the vision is it's it's clear and also that it will include all of us, not just a few. Um, so I want to thank you for supporting the Little League and continuing this process to officially move forward and closing down the airport that's no longer beneficial to our families as a whole entire community. Thank you so much. Next speaker is Irvish Kumar Mehta. You'll have two minutes to speak. Please go ahead. Thank you very much to Board of Supervisors. I wanted to acknowledge the fact uh, uh, that as uh, all the youth fields, you know, they are being they are being improved and enhanced. It is important to make sure about the safety of those fields, maintenance of those fields, and how youth can be involved in those fields. Back in times, it was uh, just a few months back. Uh, I, I heard about the uh, the little leaks. Uh, play, uh, the playground was moved, and the youth youth wasn't pleased about that. However, now having board of supervisor taking consideration of improvements at the field. And as well as taking the Red Hill uh, or San Jose Airport to be into consideration, so it is important that those fields are not being exposed to the lead, as well as causing any health issues. As you know, whenever any any sports field uh, or any facilities are being maintained, they are also being uh, considered. There is also being a consideration of taken into account that they are the recreational facility as well as sports facility, which requires the youth activities to be enabled. So also, you know, making sure about that the safety standards are also uh, up to the level. And if there are any cause of, uh, if there are any cause of a health issues, that is also, you know, something, you know, to be addressed along with that. So I want to thank you, uh, Board, of Supervisors, Board of Supervisors for taking the, uh, taking the steps in order for improving the, uh, improving the sports and the recreational facilities within the city of San Jose, as well as within the county of Santa Clara. Thank you very much. That concludes our request to speak, Mr. President. Thank you, Jill. I appreciate that. Supervisor Smitty, I'm going to turn to you first, and then I've got a question regarding the funding from San Jose that I heard uh, referenced a couple of times. Please go ahead, Supervisor Smitty. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I um, think the issue is real, and I want to get to yes. So as I start to pursue what about this and what about that, so I want to make sure everybody understands that. Uh, but I have... Uh, concerns with the way the referral is constructed, because while it's uh, cast as a referral, it really provides very specific direction and dollar amounts uh, as a practical matter. Um, and so I am concerned about the five-year uh, engagement. I'm concerned about spending a million dollars of county funds on city parks. Uh, I am was curious, frankly, about um, the use of a uh, fiscal sponsor. That prompted uh, me to ask my office to take a look at Secretary of State uh, filings, uh, only to discover that uh, each ridge has apparently been um, delinquent uh, for seven years now in terms of the registry of charitable trusts that presents some concerns in terms of uh, their ability then to uh, operate let alone fundraise uh, because i'm looking at the language from secretary uh, excuse me from attorney general rob bonta's uh, office that says a charitable organization that is not in good standing with the registry of charitable trusts may not operate or solicit donations in california uh, and uh, so that's a concern. I, I have a concern as well with the Hillview site being specifically called out. I have a concern generally about sort of pulling, um, you know, three city parks into the mix for county funding. But the Hillview site is literally across the street from the airport flight path. Uh, and um, you know, as the letter we have from San Jose Parks Foundation says, San Jose kids should not continue to play in the flight path of planes with leaded fuel over their heads. And 
uh, you know, as you all will recall, our um, uh, lead study that uh, we got, uh, gosh, back in August of 2021, specifically talks about the fact that, and I'm looking at 2.2, uh, the bulk of aircraft emissions are released during departure phases. And so, as I say, investing in a site that is literally just across the street from the end of the flight path as folks take off, I believe headed to the north, um, raises some additional public safety concerns. I, I don't wanna um, take a problematic situation and discover that we've in fact made it worse. Uh, so, uh, uh, both in terms of the scope and duration, and the, um, uh, and I get the need for immediate action. So, what I would rather do, Supervisor Chavez, if you're prepared to take it as a friendly amendment, is just go ahead and authorize, to the greatest degree that we can today, uh, two hundred fifty thousand dollars. Ask for a uh, an immediate solution to make sure that. Uh, you know, this year, this season is not interrupted, that we ask our county council's office to assist the Eastridge folks with getting their charitable status back in place, and then ask staff to come back with a uh, longer term, uh, you know, beyond a year, uh, set of proposals after they have a chance to assemble a working group, which I would hope would uh, be something they could pull together more quickly. Uh, uh, so that's my I'll offer that as a friendly amendment. If you're amenable, I, I you know, would hope we could get five votes for that today. Supervisor Chavez. Thank you. Um, let me let me walk through where we are, um, and and then you know I'm open to hear from other colleagues. I, I, that's really not the direction I would like to go in, and there are a number of reasons for that. Um, when we took our vote in August, it took us some time to be able to have conversations with all of the parties and partners that are um, impacted by this, this motion. Uh, so first, um, we were working with the city of San Jose to look at the availability of uh, parks and, um, and locations. And in fact, probably you all know this, that the fields in San Jose are pretty impacted, which is why, frankly, they, the East Church Little League stayed where it was because there was really very, it was very difficult for them to get other places to play. So the first action that we were looking at was seeing whether or not, because of the special circumstance, we could work with the city to make it avail to make uh, fields available in other locations that the um, that East Church Little League could begin playing right away. And um, that's what the, the first action addresses. Um, I think that the, the second issue about the investment in parks is that one of the challenges is that the parks aren't in a state that would allow um, them to be able to be used for practice fields. And that's why we were looking at investing in the San Jose city parks. And also it would allow the Eastridge Little League to have a prioritized usage because they all have their own policies about how they can be used. Um, the third issue is that the reason we asked for the health trust to be the fiscal agent is that we did understand Eastridge Little League had some uh, challenges and we'd like to, to both use this as an opportunity to strengthen their ability as a nonprofit, you know, as a nonprofit organization to get back on their feet and get the skills and training that they need and the support they need. Um, and the health trust were grateful, was agreeable um, to that. I think the, the point you raise about, um, it, it, let me just go back on the five years, the reason we had asked for a five year um, not to exceed contract was because we recognized that there was a lot of fear from the community that if we took an action that was let, you know, a year or even up to three, that there would be a feeling that we were sort of abandoning and pushing them off the site and kind of out of sight, out of mind, which is why we looked at the five-year contract term with the three-year check-in so that we'd be able to address the, the long-term uh, future of, the, of the, um, the Little League. Now, the, the point you raise about Hillview Park is actually a very good one and one that, um, I think that we would have to revisit that issue and do that with the city of San Jose. Frankly, we were 
desperate to find um, play locations, which is just speaks to the, you know, to the one other challenge that people and children in particular in the east side face. Um, so, yeah, so I hope that responds to the, the concerns and questions that, that you have. Thank you. I'm just going to put this up for just a second as I turn back to Supervisor Smitty and see if that shows that red line is the runway for takeoffs and landings. And this, where's my finger? This right there is Hillview Park. This red circle is the current field. Uh, this is Raging Waters. And there's another park back here behind Eastridge. But this supervised submitting, if I read you correctly, this is Hillview Park. And I know, I know that's the runway. Okay. And I think, thank, you. Yeah. thank you. Thank you. It just helps visualize it. Supervisor Smitty, and your response to Supervisor Chavez, and then Vice President Ellenberg. Yeah, I um I I, I think I heard Supervisor Chavez decline my friendly amendment. And and if so, I'm happy to offer it just formally as a uh, a motion to amend. And requiring a second, I'll second the motion to amend. Okay. And did you have further or do I turn to Vice President Ellenberg now? No, I, I, I have nothing further. Although, well, I forgive me, I misspoke. I, I think the Hillview case is just one that sort of jumped out at, at me as um, an example of why we shouldn't sort of think we know everything we need to know to plan for five years. I, I want to say again, I, I, kudos to Supervisor Chavez for bringing the item. Um, don't want kids to be playing in an unsafe place. Don't want the kids in East Ridge Little League to be left in the lurch, um, but would rather sort of put up some money right now, make the commitment today, not even wait the two weeks, uh, and say we're going to deal with the immediate issue right away and then uh, make sure that other stakeholders including the city of san jose step in, step up and do their part so i that's why i made the motion i appreciate the second and i'll let it go at that uh with the uh, motion to amend vice president ellenberg Thank you very much. Uh, I also uh, really appreciate the, the referral, and I believe that we do have an obligation to help the uh, Eastridge literally move out of their current site. We, we have clearly drawn attention to the dangers there, and I, and, and I do feel that we are responsible for helping them move. Um, Supervisor Simidian's motion or amended motion, mm -hmm. um, appeals to me for a number of, of reasons. I, I would like to get the money out the door very quickly, uh, the 250,000 uh, to help with the relocation. The other pieces, um, I, I'm, I'm not comfortable committing right now for five years. I, I don't know if that's far beyond what it would take to, to help them move, which is really our, our goal here. And I would rather have the opportunity to come back and evaluate um, after we have done this first piece, help them um, relocate to new sites. I'm, I'm very interested in hearing what the city is doing, what their role um, is there, and would certainly like a report to come back to the board. Uh, but I, I, am, um, I, I am in support of uh, Supervisor Stamidian's motion seconded by Supervisor Wasserman. Thank you. Supervisor Lee, your hand is not up, so I'll make my comments if that's all right with you. Okay, thank you. A couple of things. One I wanted to put on the public record. Um, county found out about the lead poisoning, and currently at Reed Hillview Airport, all four tanks are filled with unleaded aviation gas. I do understand there are some airplanes that fill up elsewhere, come and land at Reed Hillview, and then take off from Reed Hillview, and they may well be spewing lead emissions uh, from filling up elsewhere. Anybody who fills up currently at Reed Hillview Airport and San Martin as well, one out of one tanks there, can only get unleaded gas. And I hope in our conversations with the FAA that will be allowed to continue. 
<clears throat> but I wanted to just put that out there on the record for anybody listening so that they understood that the county took quick action by getting rid of their leaded gas and we're now doing unleaded. Most of the operations at Reed Hillview Airport are takeoffs and landings and planes coming in and out. So I'm hoping that uh, everybody there is doing the right thing and filling up with unleaded gas. When I had a Google map done and I saw the flight path of planes coming in, taking off landing, and I saw the Hillview Park, that's what concerned me there. Um, I saw where we were at. The issue of lead poisoning, we, we got the report back that we did regarding the air. There's still leaded paint in some parts of that community. There's still lead in the ground. There's still lead dirt. What the county is trying to do is prevent children from being poisoned by lead. Um, that's why I supported the amended one, the amended motion. I, I think we need to be careful where we go next. I did want clarification. Um, and before I make my final comment, Supervisor Chavez, what I was going to ask for was I made reference earlier about what I thought I heard is saying San Jose helping. And I didn't know if that was they're helping by allowing the Eastfield Little East Ridge Little League to rent space at other San Jose parks, or was there also financial relief for the Little League um, on, on our properties? That was question number one. And question number two, what I have asked of our airports division, we have that monitoring uh, system at the end of our runways. I've asked them to do a comparison once we have March 2022 in the books, a comparison of March 2021 readings versus March 2022 readings. Because as of March 1st, 2022, we've provided at our airport unleaded gasoline only. So I'm interested to see what kind of a difference that change is making. And Supervisor Chavez, um, what, what information can you share about San Jose's assistance in this matter? Yeah, so thank you for that question. And let me start by saying that I, I can't support the motion on the table. And I actually have a concern, a really significant concern about the, the which I will refer to, I think, as new direction. This the, the reason this is shaped up is in such defined buckets is because this was work done with Eastridge Little League, the city of San Jose, the Health Trust, and my office, and some of the other Little League um, leadership in the region. And each in, in all of it, it does ask for a referral to administration and county council to report back to the board. And that's very important. I'm not we're not letting the, the, the reason this is divided up the way it is, is because of conversations, which I was hoping my colleagues would appreciate the, the level of work and, um, and effort that went into shaping this so that in fact, we would be able to take some action that would set forth um, the staff being able to work with the city of San Jose. To go back and, and I'm going to answer Supervisor Wasserman your question, and then I'm going to just come back to my colleagues about um, about one other issue. Um, as it relates to the city, as you know, as a former member of the Los Gatos City Council, each of the cities has their own way of allowing people to sign up for the usage of fields and what can be done at each park because you would do so, so much community outreach to make sure that um, you know, any any action you take to change the use of a park can set neighbors, you know, uh, you know, to set a lot of concern with neighbors. So what what happened here is that the city didn't offer any financial relief. I went to them asking for fields and access. So what you see is a reflection of what they were trying to do to create uh, fields and access. There is one. So anyway, so that's why that I didn't ask them for financial support. I asked them for access to fields because, as you know, those are enormously expensive, difficult for us to get. We couldn't really build them out of whole cloth, even if we even if we had places to do that that quickly. Um, the last thing I just well, maybe not the last thing, but the other thing I just want to say to my colleagues is that this um, the reason that we were looking at the timeline had to, has to do with the fact that 
on the outside timeline, we would be looking at 2031 for um, planning and access to the current site. As you all know, in the actions that we've taken recently, we asked for sooner closure. And so the reason that I wanted the five-year timeline was that I believed that that was real, more realistic relative to helping stabilize East Ridge Little League, which this year is having its 50th anniversary, and also to be able to make sure we had a, a good amount of time under our belt relative to what the usage opportunities would be back on the site. One of the things that the staff could obviously do is have contracts that are not to exceed um, with the intent of making sure that we're stabilizing the, the Little League in the meantime. So I can't support the motion on the floor. I would ask my colleagues not to support the motion on the floor because I think what it tells the community is that we, we don't have a long-term commitment to them. And I, and I know we do. And that's why this was structured specifically the way that it was. It was done with the feedback of the community that is most impacted. Thank you. Vice President Ellenberg, your hand is raised. No? Okay. I don't see any other comments or hands raised for anybody. If that's correct, Supervisor Lee? Yes? Okay. Uh, Jill, roll call vote, please. Excuse me, Mr. Chair. The roll call vote is just on the amendment and regardless, uh, not on the amended motion, but just on the amendment. Yes? I, there, the, I've offered, because there uh, wasn't an acceptance of the amendment, by the uh, proponent, I offered uh, a motion to amend. So I believe it's only the motion to amend, which is currently uh, before us. And then following the result of that vote, the main motion will be before us if I'm following our parliamentary path today. So it's a motion to amend, not an amended motion. Yes, that, that is correct. Super, James, I'm hearing you somewhere. Yes. Uh, yes, procedurally, the, the process is that first there's a vote to amend the underlying motion. If that vote passes, the underlying motion is amended and then the underlying motion is to be voted on. So two votes would be required. So the, this vote is a vote to for the amendment to the underlying motion. So, it's, so just so I have it right, the first vote is regarding motion to amend. That is correct. Okay. And then the outcome of that vote determines the need for a second vote or not? No, the, the, it determines what the second vote is about. Okay, stand by, Mr. Williams. Yes. <laughs> all, all right. Oops, I see a hand raised by Supervisor Chavez. Yes, I, I want to make sure I, 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 I'm not sure I'm any clearer than I was a minute ago. So what I was hoping to get from from um we state James. motion what's that Should yeah we well, just one, the, that Super would be great. Submitian, would you please restate your motion to amend sure and mr chairman i'll i'll just restate where i believe we are in the process at least it was the intention of my motion uh and make sure that it passes muster with both you as the chair and mr williams as our uh parliamentarian uh supervisor chavez uh offered a motion which is the uh item that is contained in our published agenda, I seconded for purposes of discussion. I then asked if she would uh, take what I characterize as a friendly amendment. She declined. I then said, um, I'd like to offer an amendment to the motion on the floor. And that amendment was seconded by you. Um, the amendment uh, provides immediate authorization for up to $250,000 to provide, that's piece one, to assist with an immediate solution for the coming year and season uh, for the East Ridge Little League, that's piece number two. Uh, also a direction to staff and the County Council to assist the East Ridge Little League with their charitable status and their filings uh, so that they can get uh, current, uh, that's number three. Number four is to say, yes, please focus on the long term because I share the concern that Supervisor Chavez has articulated about the need for long term solutions. And number five was to convene a working group, not with a three year timeline, but with a shorter timeline so that we could look at mid and long term solutions beyond the uh, one year, uh, but with a little more opportunity for in depth study analysis and collaboration than we've had in just the last few weeks. That is the five point 
proposed amendment. And I think Mr. Williams was saying, if it passes, then we have an amended motion to vote on. And if it doesn't pass, then we vote mm -hmm. on the original motion. Fair enough. Supervisor Chavez. So, so I'm sorry, the last, the last uh, sentence. If this one passes, then we have an amended motion to vote on. If it oh, I see, I see, I see. I do. That's very confusing, but I, I understand it. Yeah, right. and I, I won't be supporting it because actually almost everything that Supervisor Simidian said is actually in the motion that I already offered. The, the only difference is that we're, that actually the, the, the concern that I have is that the difference is that the, the work that's been done by the community and the message that we're giving to the community is dramatically different, A, and B, that the reason, and I'll just restate this, that we uh, we asked the health trust to help was because that's exactly the business that they're in in terms of supporting nonprofits. So, so I won't be supporting it, and and um, you know I'm I'm concerned about it, I'm deeply concerned actually. Okay. I think we have an understanding what it is we're being asked to vote on at this time. I have a question, Supervisor Lee. Sure. Um, Supervisor Mean, uh, on your amended motion, I'm trying to understand the role of health trust here because um, uh, Supervisor Chavez, it has uh, health trust being uh, working on this as a fiscal sponsor. Are you saying that we will no longer use that? Um, I, I should have mentioned in my recitation of the motion, I believe I said it earlier, delegated authority to the county executive for the uh, expenditure of up to 250000 and for the immediate solution, if that delegated authority, which I will now underscore, is in the motion, um, if that delegated authority was used by the county executive to uh, work with the health trust uh, on the immediate solution, I think that's certainly appropriate and consistent with the motion, uh, Supervisor Lee, because I, uh, if I can anticipate a little bit where your head might be, um, if there is not a current a valid uh, charitable filing with mm -hmm. the Secretary of State, uh, they're going to need somebody to be that fiscal agent until that issue gets resolved. And uh, I'm fine with having the health trust do it. If it would make uh, you more comfortable, I'm happy to call out that direction specifically if that's acceptable to the seconder of the amendment, uh, which was Mr. Wasserman. Would that be helpful, Supervisor Lee? Yes, that's definitely helpful. All right, then with the, all right, so uh, agreed. Jill, roll call vote, please. Supervisor Lee. Aye. Supervisor Chavez. No. Supervisor Simidian. Aye. Vice President Ellenberg. Yes. And President Wasserman. Yes. All right, so that was our motion to amend that did pass and I believe we are done then. We have the main motion with the as amended uh, through the chair. And then James, could you restate the implications of that? Because I, I don't understand that. And I yeah, I, I, I want to make sure I do. I, thank I, you. I'm, I'm yeah. trying to understand what we're voting on now, how the, the prior motion as amended is different than the amendment we just did. So James. Sure, it's it's procedural, not substantive. So the, what the board just did is voted to amend the underlying motion to contain the uh, direction that Supervisor Simidian had laid out in the amendment. Now what is before the board is that underlying motion as amended. So the board needs to take a vote on that underlying motion. Understood. Okay, Supervisor Chavez, do you understand that or need additional explanation? So in a way, we have a. In a way, what we just voted on was a substitute motion from a content perspective. Is that right, James? Not an not an operations perspective, but a content perspective. Uh, from a content perspective, yes, but procedurally, okay. the two are different. I appreciate that. Thank you. Government. All right. <laughs> well, Robert's rules, exactly. and I do want to just say to my colleagues, I I am extremely disappointed by this vote. I I can't. I I want to just be upfront and clear and and I want to say to the community I do really understand that my colleagues are trying to do what they think is right on behalf of the community and I just feel obligated to make sure you all understand that 
understand that the amount of work that went into this and the consultation with the community was significant. Thank you. Thank you. Jill. Supervisor Lee. Aye. Supervisor Chavez. No. Supervisor Simidian. Aye. Vice President Allenberg. Yes. And President Wasserman. Aye. Thank All righty. You. That was item 10. It's 1135. I'd like to try and shoot for noon, depending on how this works out. 11, Jill was on consent. 12 was on consent. Do you agree? I concur, sir. Thank you very much. We now move on to item number 13. Supervisor Lee, your referral. Thank you, um, President Wasserman. Um, item 13 is a referral uh, relating to consider the helping out the two capital campaigns uh, of two of our most uh, important um, CBOs we have, the Sunnyvale Community Services and Sacred Heart Community Services to help sustain their homelessness prevention services uh, as being at the regional hubs. These are the two anchor organizations of the Emergency Assistance Network. They never shut their doors, even at the height of the pandemic, and they certainly doubled down on their mission to serve the community. In 2021, Sunnyvale Community Services served nearly 11,000 neighbors, marking a 53% increase since 2015. Similarly, Sacred Heart provided food boxes to over 15,000 families and helped disperse $71 million in direct fiscal assistance to 18,000 families during the pandemic as the heart of the county's homeless prevention system. Both organizations are projected to grow over the next five years, necessitating capital improvements to sustain their work as homelessness prevention service hubs in the northern and central parts of our county. Currently, both organizations are in the middle of multi-million dollar capital campaigns. In 2019, the Sunnyvale Community Services purchased a 36,000 square foot facility off of Kern Avenue and moved in last year. The new facility offers double the warehouse space for food storage and distribution, more than double the office space for client services, business offices for the county and partner agencies to provide services, and then also community room. Sacred Heart plans to make renovations at its current facility on South First Street in San Jose to expand its food and clothing programs, adding warehousing, community, and learning space, ADA improvements, bathroom upgrades, and replacement of its HVAC systems. It has also purchased a new 12,000 square foot building further down on South First Street, and renovations are also severely needed. Like elevator installation and other AD improvements, bathroom upgrades, HVAC replacement, roof repairs, construction of programs, community and tra training spaces. This referral seeks to identify funding from the county to help support these capital campaigns for these amazing organizations. Just as they have cared for the community in partnership with the county, we need to care for them as they grow to meet the demand of the services that's growing as we continue to recover from the pandemic. This would not be the first time the board supported a capital campaign of an emergency assistance network agency. Through the budget process last year, the board approved funding to, for, for example, supported the West Valley Community Services capital campaign at the request of Supervisor Submitting. With these new facilities, both Sunnyvale Community Services and Sacred Heart will be poised to be partners of the county for many decades to come. And I hope my colleague will support this as well. Thank you. Supervisor Lee, was that your motion? Yes, that is my I motion. I will second, and I'll ask Thank if you. we could include in the referral, Mr. Chairman, uh, the uh, needs of the um, Community Services Agency in Mountain View. We've got you know three different EANs in the uh, North County, West Valley area, uh, they all have their needs, I understand. All right. But uh, that one in particular has long been uh, sort of central to the effort given the pockets of poverty in that particular part of the district and has um, uh, frankly was too darn small when I uh, came back on the board in 2013 and the demand has just gotten greater regrettably ever since. Supervisor Lee, can I pr prevail upon mm -hmm. you to throw uh, one more into the mix for the report back? Yeah, for the report back, certainly we'll look at all of them. I think they are doing great work and uh, thank you for bringing that up. Thank you. 
Thank you, Vice President Ellenwood and Supervisor Chavez. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, Supervisor Lee, I, I think I just heard you say for purposes of the report, yes, we can look at all of them. I, I want to make sure that we are um, are really focused as as we always uh, promise to be on on equity. And we do have a number of CBOs within our emergency assistance network. Um, and, and I would rather than pointing piecemeal um, to projects that are absolutely worthy. I'm, I'm not contesting the value that Sunnyvale uh, Shelter or Sacred Heart provide. I just always want us to be holistic uh, and make sure that we are meeting need, that we are not um, uh, leaving out or, or not being mindful of, of need that may exist, but that wasn't brought forward uh, by one of us. And if the report back can include an overview of uh, all of the CBOs within our emergency assistance network with, with recommendations. I would be glad to support this today. Thank you. That's what he said, I believe, Supervisor Lee? Yes, thank correct. You. Thank you, Supervisor Chavez. Thank you, and thank you for bringing the referral forward. I, um, I, I was actually gonna suggest what Supervisor Ellenberg just suggested, and when the report comes back, I think it would be important to understand um, what resources are already being leveraged what the act and what actual needs there are and then lastly um you know i i do really recognize that the um the creating capacity for each of these nonprofits is really the intent and so better understanding the how each action impacts capacity, I think would be very helpful because if the board, and I don't know if this would be the case, but if the board needed to prioritize, probably there are a number of those areas that we would need to take a look at to determine what the prioritization would be and how much money would be available. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we have one speaker. Let's let that person have two minutes and we'll come back for a vote. Our first speaker is Irvish. I'm unmuting you. You'll have two minutes to speak. Thank you very much to Board of Supervisor again for the opportunity to speak and consideration of comments. I wanted to mention about uh, the Second Heart Community Services and as, as well as uh, the contributing to, not just contributing to the Sunnyville Community Services. The Second Heart uh, Services, they have a branches within the city of San Jose. They are also serving as a food pantry uh, nonprofit organization to city of Mupitas. They are also serving to the part of a hope services within the city of Mountain View. So Second Heart Community Services is open to all the individuals as well as homeless people, as well as, and more importantly, they've also provided the resources and the shelters during the specifically under the COVID-19 situation when there were national guards were out there in the in the county of Santa Clara during the uh, during the convention center to prepare the medical facility there were also second harvest volunteers were out there to help out preparing the beds as well so it is important to to recognizing such organizations specifically you know when they are opening the doors in terms of a lot many services to to provide uh, to the citizens in terms of uh, in, in conditions like a pandemic so certainly i wanted to acknowledge that and also supporting the activities of a Second Heart Community Services. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next speaker is Marie Bernard. I'm unmuting you. You'll have two minutes to speak. Please go ahead. Go ahead. Good morning, Board President, President, uh, President Wasserman and all the supervisors and staff at Santa Clara County. My name is Marie Bernard. I'm the Executive Director of Sunnyvale Community Services and I thank Supervisor Lee for proposing this referral. I also wanna point out that Supervisor Lee and I reached out to our sister agencies. We're one of seven emergency assistance agencies. And so I would expect that all of the supervisors will be hearing from our sister agencies because yes, we are CBOs who have been standing in the community for, community for many years, serving as the safety net. Um, together, our seven agencies support every zip code in our county as the safety net services. And our two agencies, Sacred Heart and Sunnyvale Community Services, have served the community for over 50 years. Our mission is preventing homelessness and hunger. We are based in Sunnyvale, but we also follow a no wrong door policy, helping any county resident who comes to our door to ensure that they're connected to benefits and services. 
We're very grateful that both Supervisor Lee and Supervisor Simidian have visited our site many times at our old building and also toured our new facility during construction. Our old site was woefully inadequate before the pandemic. Somehow we remained open at our cramped building, which we were allowed to do because the city of Sunnyvale had purchased it and allowed us to stay there for free, helping a record number of residents to remain housed and fed. Our new facility is fully accessible. It is a much needed hub in North County for safety net services. We have great capacity for partner agencies and the county to deliver services there on site for no, uh, so that people can do one-stop shopping to get the safety net that they need. We'd like to invite all the supervisors and our county staff to visit both Sacred Heart and Sunnyvale Community Services to see our work in action. We're committed to be beacons of hope here in our county for decades to come. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker is Victor Vasquez. You'll have two minutes to speak. Please go ahead. Good morning, Victor Vasquez. That's almost made for. I would like to extend my support for both Sacred Heart and the Sunnyvale Community Center. Overall, like this is, um, these are the services that marginalized communities need to to survive. Um, and for us as an organization that would like to see East San Jose and all residents thrive, these are important organizations that are serving the overall community. And so I also wanna thank uh, Supervisor Susan Ellenberg for the approach of looking at all the different partners who, who might also need uh, support. Um, and I like that approach in terms of like thinking about um, the overall si uh, system that, that needs to be reinforced, reinforced preserved and improved. Uh, so the communities that are marginalized and receiving these services can have places that they can feel proud of and, and uh, participate in. So I want to thank the board for, for considering this and also uh, Supervisor Ellenberg's equity uh, and systems approach. Thank you. That concludes our request to speak. Thank you for that, Jill. We have a motion. We have a second. Seeing no other hands, roll call vote, please. Supervisor Lee. Aye. Supervisor Chavez. Yes. Supervisor Samedian. Aye. Vice President Ellenberg. Yes. And President Wasserman. Yes. Thank you, Jill. Item 14 was handled on consent. We now turn to our county exec, item 15, for his report. Um, supervisors, can you hear me? I'm sorry. Yes, yes we can. All right. Um, I wanted to speak um, pretty much exclusively about the Ukraine issue today. Um, I was asked to give a report about what's going on at the state and local level regarding investments. <clears throat> the uh, governor sent a letter to CalPERS and CalSTARS and to UC retirement system uh, on February 28th, asking for them to report back about their investment portfolio. Their report back was um, that they had ceased all transactions with Russia and publicly traded equities um, and that they were actively assessing their real estate investments and that um, they were reviewing emerging markets and other financial markets. Um, the US uh, Office of Foreign Assets has got sanctions in place which will affect CalPERS. Um, there's also a um, divestment uh, bill going through the legislature from uh, Cortese and McGuire um, called SB 1328 started on March 3rd, um, which if passed will um, commit the state to divestment of any uh, equities from Russia. Um, in terms of our investments at our local mixed pool, um, we don't have any direct investments in Russia. The only um, thing we do have investments is, is some oil, um, which is a small part, our oil companies, which is a small part of our uh, portfolio. And the major part of that group um, is Exxon, which has divested interest and refused to accept um, oil from Russia. So um, I think we're fairly well covered in that respect. 
Um, the other thing that we should talk about is that uh, the board will consider uh, next meeting the possibility of how we should deal with the sister city relationship with Moscow. This has been somewhat confusingly represented in the press. There are two relationships that are in effect. One is the actual sister city relationship, which theoretically requires a relationship between the governments of, of uh, the county and the government of the city of Moscow. Actually, that has never act been perpetuated in a contract. And then there is the creation of the um, sister city commission, which is a separate issue. Um, and our recommendation on next on the next meeting will be that we continue with the commission, but um, indicate our interest in separating our sister city relationship between the two governmental entities. Um, that's pretty much all I have to say about that at this time. Thank you. We're probably our only asset up is the Exxon. Any further questions? No, we'll turn to James for your report, please, on County Council. There were no reportable actions taken at the closed session meeting of March 7th, 2022, and that concludes my report. Thank you very much. 17 was handled in consent. 18 is going to take a little while. Um, that brings us down to 20, I believe, Jill, and 23. And I don't see any of those ending in 10 minutes. Supervisors, uh, do you agree we then have 24 and 25? I don't see any of those ending that quickly. I suggest we break for lunch now. And if it's all right with you, we'll do something unusual. We'll take an hour and five minute lunch break and come back at one o'clock. Does that work? Thank you, yes. Okay, good enough. Thumbs up, I know, and the clerk, the clerk agrees too. Thank, Thank you. you all very much. See you at one. Thank you. Recording stopped.
Recording in progress. I see, I see all five supervisors. Do, do, do. Well, up until an hour ago, the Dow was trying to alleviate our CalPERS stock issues. All righty. One o'clock. Jill, roll call vote, please. Supervisor Lee. Good afternoon, Lee present. Supervisor Chavez. Here. Supervisor Simidian. Here. Vice President Ellenberg. I'm here. And President Wasserman. Here as well. Thank you very much, Jill. We're going to go with our one o'clock with our public health officer and administration uh, update regarding COVID-19. And then we will go from there, supervisors, to item 18. Dr. Cody and company. Thank you. This is Dr. Sarah Cody. Uh, just to give you a brief update on uh, COVID-19 in our county. So I'll provide a brief update uh, on the epidemiology and at the end I'll wrap up with what's next in our pandemic response. And then you'll also hear an update on testing vaccination hospitalizations as always from Dr. Kamal and an out update on outreach from Brian Darrow and on isolation and quarantine support from our Office of Supportive Housing. So to start with our epidemic curve as always, uh, here we are way over on the right at the tail end of the fifth wave of the pandemic. And our cases have been consistently declining since they, their peak on January 9, which was almost exactly two months ago. Uh, and you can just barely begin to make out that while our cases are still declining, the rate of decline does look to be slowing just a little bit. We saw more cases many more cases during the Omicron surge than at any previous surge. Um, and this was the case even in our very highly vaccinated uh, population. And of course, this was in large part due to the incredible uh, transmissibility uh, of Omicron. Next slide. So as you know, uh, because we're seeing more and more a shift to in-home antigen testing uh, that we need to rely on other systems as well so that we can understand the level of COVID in the community uh, and the community and the transmission. And we have been fortunate to have a very robust wastewater surveillance program in our county way back since the fall of 2020. And it covers the majority of our population. And we know that these data correlate really nicely with our case data. And we can also see here, as we saw in the cases, that the concentration in all four of our sewer sheds um, have been on the decline. Uh, and our current levels are now down to where they were a bit before Christmas, um, but they're still higher than they were uh, before the Omicron surge started. Next slide. And I'm just gonna end my, this very brief epi update with this graph of COVID deaths by week um, in our county over the last two years. So to date, we have lost 2,158 people uh, from COVID in our county. And as you can see there in the Omicron surge, the Omicron surge was deadlier than the Delta wave. And this is despite the fact that Omicron on an individual basis causes a milder illness. And I, I, I just think this is important to, to point out, which is that it has to do with the fact that the sheer number of cases was so large that even a small proportion of a very large number can still be a lot of people. 
And it also for me illustrates another point, which is that we must continue to think about our community, not just think about individuals, because on an individual level, you could say, well, Omicron's not so bad, but on a community level, Omicron was much, much worse than Delta. And that's a very, very important point. So with that, I will um, turn the presentation over to Dr. Kamal. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Cody, and good afternoon, supervisors. In terms of testing update, um, we continue to provide testing um, throughout the county. The rate has gone down significantly, as you can see, following our surge. Our positivity rate also is below 3% now, and our turnaround times have improved since the uh, decrease in volume. Next slide. In terms of who's doing the testing, we continue to see that throughout the peaks and valleys of testing demand, the county healthcare system remains the leader in testing, really outperforming all other systems put together um, for most of the time period. Right. In terms of vaccinations, we have also seen a decline in demand, but are continuing to supply this vital service throughout the county. Um, including boosters and even some first doses, which people are still coming in. In terms of pediatrics, we do have a plan in place that the uh, minute that these are approved, we are going to be ready. Next slide. And finally, in terms of hospitalizations, more good news to report here that our uh, peak number of hospitalization has gone down by quite a bit. It was up to 533 and is now around 200. Um, next slide. And over the past week or so, we've seen uh, low and stable numbers throughout the hospitals. And over to uh, Brian Darrow. Thank you, Dr. Kamal. So next slide. So at the last meeting of the board, Supervisor Chavez had requested an update on how our community outreach work is evolving, particularly as it relates to door-to-door -to -door outreach. So I wanted to start, though, just kind of with a sum some summary numbers. As the board is well aware, uh, since you launched the program, uh, starting in August of 2020, the Shabet program was launched, and we contracted with several community-based organizations uh, through that program to provide information and resources really to help reduce the spread of the virus and, and to respond to those immediate community needs. So since that time, our teams, those teams have knocked on over 330,000 residential doors where they've spoken with over 185,000 individuals now and more than 48,000 businesses have been visited. Just wanted to flag those are those are not unduplicated numbers because some doors and businesses we did visit multiple times as we were talking about the health orders or providing information and opportunities to sign up for vaccinations or boosters but it was quite a volume of outreach that's been done and continues to be done but uh just wanted to share some of the overall numbers and some of the impact uh, of the of that outreach next slide please so the outreach approach is evolving. Um, given the uncertainty of the pandemic, we started really with short-term contracts with our partners, which have been extended um, many times be just as the pandemic evolved and as, as needs kind of evolved. But with some funding from the CDC and from the state, we've shifted now to try to implement longer-term agreements with many of the same partners that we were working with from the very beginning. And that work is kind of is focused in a continued way on supporting the immediate needs related to COVID. So continuing to do vaccination, you know, connect folks to, to vaccines and um, testing and all of the things that have been done, but also kind of incorporating longer term health and resiliency needs, connecting folks to primary care, thinking about chronic disease management and, and other kind of longer term approaches. So those new agreements are managed by public health rather than the EOC, as we try to embed more of our COVID response efforts into the normal operations of the counties. And, and, and of course the grants are flowing through the public health department, but the race, racial and health equity team in public health has been managing all that good work. It's a little bit less heavily focused on door-to-door -door outreach. Although we do continue to have 16 full-time uh, staff in the field every day, doing focus exclusively on door-to-door -door outreach and that'll, that work will continue at least through March. 
at the end of March. Um, one thing that is not changing and won't change related to our outreach approach is just partnering with um, culturally and linguistically competent and very well connected community based organizations that's been a central part of the success of the uh, outreach work that's happened, and so that will certainly be something that continues next slide. And then I won't go through all this information on the slide, but these are the contracts that public health has put in place with uh, related to community engagement uh, and managed by the race, racial and health equity team. One thing, other thing to flag, in addition to what's on the slide here, the Office of Supportive Housing has also launched some new um, important contracts uh, with actually through Amigos de Guadalupe, which is partnering with several other organizations, and they are focused on conducting door to door outreach to provide tenants rights uh, information and to help people with emergency rental assistance applications. So that work is happening now. There, um, I believe about 1200 or so doors are being knocked on each week uh, as, as that program has been rolled out. And with that, I will hand it over to our to Consuelo, I believe, from the JDOC. Good afternoon, uh, board members. My name is Hong Kao with the Office of Supportive Housing, and I will be providing the updates on the isolation and quarantine support program. So as you know, the isolation and quarantine support program assists persons who have tested positive or who have been exposed to COVID-19 with resources to safely isolate or quarantine. The purpose of our program is to decrease transmission rates among the most vulnerable to con contract those that are most vulnerable to contracting COVID-19 by providing them with a hotel room to safely isolate or quarantine, a delivery of food and resources to their homes, and financial assistance to replace lost income to overcome any financial hardships. Next slide, please. The county piloted this program on June 17, 2020, and through February of last of this year, we have helped over 4,000 persons, including persons without a permanent home, to safely isolate or quarantine in hotels. And we have provided groceries and supplies to approximately 8,500 households um, to, to be able to safely isolate or quarantine at home. And we have distributed over $17.6 million in direct rental and financial assistance to over 8,600 households. Next slide, please. This graph highlights the number of referrals received by our program during the pandemic compared to the number of COVID-19 cases on a seven-day moving average. The trend shows an increased number of referrals received during the surge last winter, the surge with the Delta variant, and finally the Omicron variant with approximately 90% of residents in San Jose being assisted with our program. Next slide, please. As the county is transitioning from a pandemic response to an assessment of the continuation of this work on an ongoing basis, the current needs in the community have shifted to focus on protecting the most, the unhoused population from community transmission while maintaining capacity in our existing congregate shelters and to ensure those who are most vulnerable will have access to resource linkages in the community. Next slide, please. The administration is proposing the following timeline for the wind down of the isolation and quarantine support program, starting with our IQ hotel. Effective March 15th, we will begin operating one hotel to prioritize placements for unhoused people coming from congregate settings, as well as those unhoused people that are being discharged from hospitals. We are currently going to, um, we are currently contracting, negotiating a contract with a shelter provider to manage this hotel site through the end of this fiscal year. And effective March 31st, we are proposing uh, to stop taking new referrals for financial assistance and at-home support and focus staffing resources in the month of April to process all pending financial assistance referrals. And finally, during the next three months, 
we will be consolidating our two hotlines to focus on ensuring a warm handoff process to connect and refer households to existing county and re city resources by enhancing our coordination through PIO, Public Health Department, along with other county and city partners. And we will be updating our program website to redirect residents to these resources. Next slide. Following the wind down timeline, the Office of Supportive Housing will be able to release approximately 80% of its, of its disaster service workers to their home departments by the end of April and focus on a transition plan to ensure continued operations of the isolation and quarantine hotel for our most vulnerable unhoused people. And now I will turn it back to Dr. Cody. Dr. Cody, there she is. Dr. Cody, we can't hear you if you're speaking. Jill, any thoughts on what's going on? There you go. There can we you, go. Can you hear me now, Supervisor? Yes, we can. Thank you. Wonderful. Um, I'm going to start this part by just giving a little bit of background about what's going on at the national and state level. The first uh, thing that I wanted to share are CDC's new COVID-19 community levels and indicators. Uh, this is different than the framework that they had been using which was around uh, uh, community transmission. So the new framework has three different variables that they look at. One is the new cases uh, per 100,000 population over a week, and you either have fewer than 200 or 200 and more. And then the other two have to do with hospitals, uh, one around admissions and the other around staff beds. And based on these metrics, every county in the country is classified as low, medium, or high. And then there's recommendations based on the level. Mostly I show you uh, this to point out that this is uh, quite different from what we had before because the focus is really on the outcome, what happens to the hospital system, rather than the uh, amount of transmission in a, in a community. And so while it is helpful as an off-ramp to know when you can dial things down, these are all lagging indicators. So it's not so great for an early warning sign to know when you need to um, uh, increase caution and be more careful. The next slide just shows this comparison between on the right, the old CDC's uh, COVID-19 transmission levels, which you can still find on their website. And, you, um, and then on the left, the new COVID-19 community level. So the take home message here is that on the right, you can see that most counties in the country are still red, whereas on the left, most counties in the country are green. Um, and if you're only if you're in a red county on the left, does the CDC recommend indoor masking? And then in all other areas, it's really a matter of individual choice, which is quite interesting because under the old uh, framework, if you're in red, uh, certainly indoor masking is recommended. And I also just point this out to highlight that in California and in Santa Clara County, we still strongly recommend indoor masking. The next slide, uh, the, both the, um, uh, the state of California as well as uh, the US have put out COVID preparedness plans. The national plan, uh, you can see there are four main goals there, protect against and treat COVID-19, prepare for new variants, and that's a lot about surveillance, particularly genomic surveillance to identify new variants, um, a goal to prevent uh, major disruptions uh, to the economy and to education, as well as a goal to vaccinate the world. And the vaccinate the world goal is related to the preparation for new variants. It's really a prevention uh, strategy around new variants. 
California's plan, the goals are to minimize the strain on the healthcare system, keep staff and public safe, and keep businesses and schools open and in person. Um, and so the how to get there has a lot with increasing vaccination rates, especially among children, and some preparedness efforts such as stockpiling personal protective equipment um, and ensuring that hospitals and communities have resources. The SMARTER plan, in short, stands for shots, masks, awareness, readiness, testing, education, and treatment. And then the next slide, what's next in our county? I would say that our, very, our core values that we've held throughout the pandemic, one, prevention, better to prevent the bad thing from happening than to treat it after it happens, and equity to ensure that everyone has equal opportunity uh, for health and, and access to opportunity and resources. Those are values that we have held and held them steadfast throughout the pandemic and will continue, uh, they will continue to guide us going forward. We will maintain the infrastructure for mass testing and vaccination and preserve our ability to scale up and down as the demand changes. And then very critical within the public health department um, uh, to maintain this really key critical infrastructure, both maintain and improve our data and surveillance systems, which we know we really don't know where we are unless we have good data and surveillance our ability to investigate problems thoroughly as they arise to, again, to understand what's going on and what we need to do, including uh, any policy changes. And as Brian detailed uh, very nicely, the importance of community engagement and response and understanding that the relationships that we built with community leaders and the level of trust um, is really key to our ability to facilitate uh, protection and safety and wellness for our communities. Next slide. So this is a summary of our pandemic priorities moving forward. Uh, prevention, this includes vaccination and testing. This is all in an effort to reduce the burden uh, of COVID, both long-term COVID um, disruptions from COVID as well as serious illness, hospitalization, and death. To, in, to continue to engage um, with communities, particularly most vulnerable populations, to ensure that they have access to vaccinations, testing, treatment, and any other resources that are available and, and will help. Uh, build to build our infrastructure, um, particularly in surveillance, outbreak response, and community engagement, as I mentioned in the past slide. And to scale, particularly testing and vaccination, again, as uh, we touched on in the last slide. And finally, to prepare and continue to be prepared. And this is both preparedness with healthcare system partners. Um, long-term care facility partners, the public the education system, and so many other stakeholders uh, with whom we have all worked throughout the pandemic. With that, we are happy to answer questions on any uh, component of the presentation. Thank you, Dr. Cody. Thank you, Dr. Kamal. Thank you, Consuelo. Thank you, Brian. Uh, we've got a few members from the public. Let's allow them to speak first, then we'll come back to supervisors, if that's all right with supervisors. Would you like, like the clock for two minutes, Mr. President? Yes, please, Jill. Thank you. Our first speaker is Ryan. I'm unmuting you. You'll have two minutes to speak. Timer will start when you begin speaking. Good afternoon. My name is Ryan, a firefighter in Santa Clara County. I spoke first during yesterday's public comment and was pleased to find the health order was amended. I had been planning on maxing out my three minutes today, directing my comments towards Dr. Cody and her team. However, I'm again pleased to not have to do that. I did not, however, want to miss the opportunity to express my thanks to the Santa Clara County Board of Supervisors. I'll probably never know how much influence you had on this change, or if it was simply the avalanche of developments over the past few weeks and multiple lawsuits at the county's doorsteps. But regardless of the details, there is no doubt, at the very least, you had to be the soundboard for all the emotions and frustrations. That by itself is draining and deserves a thank you. 
I never felt you had anything to do with the order in the first place, but unfortunately for you, you had to be our conduit. President Wasserman, I believe you said this is your last term in government. I'm happy for you that on this subject, you won't look back with regrets. Regardless of your position on vaccinations, the health order as originally written was not right. And for the rest of you, thank you for listening to our pleas. God bless you and your families. Thank you. Next speaker is Adam Cole. You'll have two minutes to speak. Timer will start when you begin speaking. This is Adam Cole with SEMA. We were heartened to see the updated health order that was issued yesterday. This aligns our county's policy on exemptions and accommodations with our sister counties and employers. Prior to this change, we had members with medical exemptions who were facing effective termination or significant demotion. We are looking forward to seeing the county as an employer implement the updated guidance as soon as possible. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next speaker is Blair Beekman. You'll have two minutes to speak. Please go ahead. Hi, uh, Blair Beekman here. Uh, thanks a lot for this item. Thanks for the previous public comment. Uh, I think it just reminded myself uh, of the good work that the SEIU was doing with teachers unions around the Bay Area and Chicago in the past few months. They were trying to rally uh, public health and safety practices and good concerns uh, that did not necessarily have to rely on the vaccination process. And I thought it was really interesting. It was a really interesting, constructive, positive way to work. And uh, I think it hopefully offered really important lessons for ourselves, how, how we may have to uh, deal with these sort of issues in our future. So thank you to them and their, and their work. And thank you uh, what you can be doing at this time to uh, as we're, we're considering uh, the vaccine mandate process and, and, the, and the entire COVID process in, in uh, slightly different terms. Thank you. And with that said, to speak on the surveillance and uh, data collection and technology issues that, that uh, is of concern uh, for yourselves at uh, this time, a reminder of what uh, good guidelines and open public policies and practices with technology um, there's there's issues of say bio camera uh, biometric camera data that's 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 starting to be more worked on and asked about and and practiced in 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 say the VTA and other places um, how can that be open and accountable to the public how can that be a process uh, to, to be more easily understood. It's through open public policies and accountability that simply creates a, a, a way to have an important good dialogue where all people can be involved in a real neutral space that discusses our future, that asks what is our future. And uh, we can work on that future together with, with good policy guidelines and practices. Thank you. Next speaker is Colin Connors. You'll have two minutes to speak. Timer will start when you begin speaking. Hello. Um, I have some data and science for you all to follow. On March 2nd, when the face diaper mandated, mandate ended in Santa Clara County, the deaths in Santa Clara were 111 per 100K, and the hospitalization was 238. In contrast, Travis County, Texas had 100 deaths per 100K and their hospitalization was 164 on the exact same day. So if you follow the data, we are worse off than a county with a lower vaccination rate, no face diaper mandates and no shelter in place. So everything you and Nurse Ratchet did that destroyed businesses, muzzled our kids for more than a year, and fired our first responders, did absolutely nothing and probably made matters worse. So if we follow the science and the data, the only thing we know for a fact is that you are all officially the board of stoop advisors. Thank you and have a great day. Next speaker is Irvish Kumar Mehta. You'll have two minutes to speak. Please go ahead. Thank you very much to board of supervisors again for the opportunity to speak. Uh, I think there are quite a few improvements that have been made uh, along with the COVID-19 situation. The mask mandate, as well as the recommendation whether the masks are required and do or not. Both social distancing protocols are in place. It is important that the children under the age of five 
and children with the, from age six to 12 are still you know, being considered for the vaccinations and as well as for the booster shot. We also have to be mindful about that how the virtual and the distance learning program are also improving the education resources within the school. So considering the COVID-19 situation going from pandemic to pandemic, we have to ensure that there are certain steps you know, that is to be taken. And so would be the case that you know, there, is all, all, there is also going to be a risk there's also going to be a resistance to some of the prevention policies that is going to be in place. However, considering the recommendation and diligently putting the right set of standards for the policy to be in place would allow, and also people to help understand that there are still children out there who require education, resources, and also the immunity, which is required to improve the health. Not every individual within the same age criteria being able to being able to cultivate their and adjust the environment similarly as what the different ages would be able to in the similar environment. That's the right test of an individual or the person or a citizen where they are being placed in the similar environment with the different ages and then you know considering the test for them. So thank you very much for consideration and taking the steps towards putting the right uh, putting the uh, right resources for the policy in place. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next speaker is Kevin. You'll have two minutes to speak. Timer will start when you begin speaking. Good afternoon, Board of Supervisors. Uh, my name is Kevin Rapport. I'm a Stan Clark County firefighter. I've called in a few times here. Um, I'm calling in today to say thank you to the board. Um, as we've had a number of firefighters not allowed to work uh, due to this health order, uh, we were just 10 days out from our administration trying to fast track uh, terminations of firefighters um, when all we wanted to do was get back to work and continue safely serving the public. Um, and now with the change in the health order, we can do that. And the cities that we serve are safer because of it. Uh, so again, I want to express my gratitude. I want to say thank you to the Board of Supervisors, uh, specifically Supervisor Chavez, uh, for really taking the time to listen to us and support us in getting back to work. Uh, I sincerely hope nothing like this ever happens again. I hope the firefighters now returning to work will not be targeted and retaliated against by our department administration. Uh, and again, I, I thank you uh, very, very much for the support and the push to modify this mandate to allow us to work again and serve the public safe, safely. So thank you very much. Have a great day. Thank you. Next speaker is Dalila Polito. You'll have two minutes to speak. Please go ahead. Hi, we have a lot of workers from various county departments that have been on unpaid leave since 11-21. Um, what about those workers? We've reached out to labor relations and union to find out if all the workers that were placed on unpaid leave will be reinstated. No one can give us a straight answer. It is not right to, keep, to continue to keep these workers in limbo. Please, someone reach out and let them know what's going on. This is not okay, this is not right. If you are going to pick and choose who gets to return, who gets reinstated, then there, 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 that is a serious problem because that's continuing with the discrimination. Thank you. Bye. Next speaker is Joe Andrews. You'll have two minutes to speak. Please go ahead. Good afternoon, Board of Supervisors. Um, I'm a county firefighter, and I just wanted to say uh, thank you for listening to to the community listening to us uh, with our concerns with this county health order. Thank you for um, all your actions to collaborate and uh, find a solution that, that is, uh, works for the best interests of uh, public health while at the same time uh, basically saving, saving our jobs as firefighters. Um, I just wanna say thanks once again and uh, have a great day. Thank you. Next speaker is Candice Nguyen. I'm unmuting you. You'll have two minutes to speak. Please go ahead. Good afternoon, Honorable Board of Supervisors. My name is Candice Nguyen. I am a nurse manager, and this May would be seven years that I have proudly worked for Santa Clara County. I come from a family where we have two generations of family members who are Buddhist monks or have joined the monastery life. I wanna thank you for your support in allowing for tolerance in the workplace. 
Specifically, thank you for recognizing the exemptions of county staff. We will continue to follow weekly testing guidelines already in place, and we are grateful for the compassion our Board of Supervisors have demonstrated today. We hope to see the county implement the new guidance as soon as possible. Thank you. And Jill, we're going to limit our speakers to the ones that we have currently registered now. Thank you. Next speaker is Joe Moses. You'll have two minutes to speak. Timer will start when you begin speaking. Good afternoon, supervisors. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. My name is Joe Moses. I was born and raised here in Santa Clara County. I'm proud to be working with my hometown agency as a fire captain with the Santa Clara County Fire Department. I'm one of the five county fire employees who received a termination letter from my agency as a result of the December 28th health order mandating COVID shots and boosters for first responders. My 13 year career and my family's livelihood was threatened. My termination would have been effective on Friday, March 25th. I am here today to express my gratitude to all of you. Along with many other first responders in the county, I have sent each of you emails, letters, asking for help, anything to help save our jobs. Thank you. Thank you for working with the county health officer and county executive officer to update the health order and stop the mandate. I want to specifically express my sincere appreciation to Supervisor Chavez for her support and communication via phone calls and Zoom meetings over the past several weeks as we work together towards a common goal to protect public health while retaining employee positions for those of us who directly serve our community. Moving forward, I hope we, including future boards, can focus on both public health and employee retention for the county so we don't ever have to go through this again during this, this health crisis or any others. Again, thank you to all of you, each of you, your staff members for your time and energy in this and working to update the health order. I'm looking forward to returning to work this week. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker is Matt. I'm unmuting you. You'll have two minutes to speak. Please go ahead. Hello, I wanted to reach out and thank the Board of Supervisors for their time, energy, and efforts into this specific topic. None of us will ever know the energy and effort that has been put into it. And we appreciate the change in this mandate for all of us healthcare workers and first responders that have been affected by it. Thank you. Thank and you. that concludes our request to speak, Mr. President. Thank you, Jill. Members, as you know, this is a um, receive report only. Do any of you have any questions of our public health officials? If not, I've got a couple of comments just to make. Seen, nope, Supervisor Chavez and then Vice President Ellenberg. Thank you. And I, I want to begin by thanking the staff very much for the the just amazing work, not just the report, but the, the amazing work that you've been doing. Um, I wanted to start with Dr. Cody and and Dr. Cody, um, I know you touched on this, but I just wanted to see if you could give maybe a little bit of reflection on. And I, I know this is a crystal ball question, but a little bit of a reflection on what you see coming down the pike relative to uh, the disease itself in our in our country and in particular in the state of California. Thank you, Supervisor. I, of course, nobody knows what's ahead, uh, but I think that we can anticipate that we will continue to see surges uh, or peaks how, or waves, however you want to call them. What we won't know is exactly what they'll look like. And, and so it depends on which variant emerges, how quickly does it spread, um, how sick does it make people, and uh, does it evade immunity, either from natural infection or from vaccination. And so those are the three features that we look out for, but it's largely unknown. But I think we will continue to have surges. Of course, we won't know what they're like, and we won't know how often they are. Some people predict Maybe we'll fall into a pattern where we have a summer and winter. Some people predict that they'll just happen randomly. Um, I think it's, it's, it's hard to say. What we do know, and I think this is reflected in the state's plan and our own plan, is that there is really no scenario under which we can say that we don't need to be prepared. <laughs> um, and that's why we are going to continue to be ready to scale up uh, testing and vaccination 
that's why we need to continue to invest in data and surveillance um, and uh, and working with community uh, community members. And Dr. Cody, this may be a question um, that overlaps with you and Dr. Smith, but you know, based on that, I'm, I'm wondering if you could align that with a little bit more with the next steps that you're recommending. And, and in particular, um, you know, one of the, the um, one of the things that I, I know I've been thinking a lot about, and I'm sure you have too, is what we now do in a situation where we're going to be looking at potentially multiple um, issues kind of coming at us at the same time. And just a you know recollection of both COVID, always the flu season, um, wildfires, heat waves, power shutoffs, you know, based on what we've just experienced over the last two years, could you maybe just spend a moment talking about the EOC and then the, the work that will go on, um, what it appears to me is perhaps partly under public health and partly under the new um, EOC. And, and what's prompted the, the question is the one of the slides that Brian presented on. Let me try that one. Um, as the board knows, you approved uh, the addition of a number of uh, positions uh, that will function as replacements for the DSWs. And we envision that uh, many of them will stay permanent within the uh, Office of Emergency Management um, and essentially be permanent staff to be able to respond to not only COVID um, as needed, but also other disasters and um, responses that are needed. Um, you know, we've had staffing there in the past, but it's really been only administrative staffing. And then we steal away the DSWs when we need to. This uh, particular pandemic has taught us that we need to have more permanent staff to be able to do warehousing, logistics, and um, finance, and all of the other backup services that need to be done. In terms of our current capacity to scale up and down Mastex team and MOVAX, um, as was mentioned, we'll keep the infrastructure capable, but we are scaling down those services and sending DSWs back to their um, department of origin. And the at the same time, we've added positions to public health and are investing in building an ongoing infrastructure there that will be more able to respond efficiently and effectively to a further future pandemic or future health emergency as well as being able to um, keep monitoring and, and make sure that there's good surveillance of what's going on with the health of the community. And there um, we will continue some modified um, increased outreach. Um, as Brian brought out, we've had lots of success with door-to-door -door knocking and also community information. And, and um, we don't think that that should be terminated. It needs to be scaled down, I guess, a little bit, but um, we won't terminate it. And that will live in uh, public health along with uh, EOC. So I hope that answers the question. Yeah, that's really helpful, Dr. Smith. Here's um, just a a little bit of thinking about that. I know um, from a discussion you and I had that you will be working on an after action um, report. And a, a few things that I want to recommend in that. One of them is obviously that we take a big slice of the community that in, was engaged with us, everything from neighborhood leaders to school board members to um, our com community ambassadors to some of our nonprofit partners just to better, um, and especially as it relates to the community health partnership, but just to better understand what we learned. And I think to better understand the strength of our departments, because 
I think the point you raise is a really good one about what would be in the Office of Emergency Management versus the Health Department versus, frankly, I'd, I'd be thinking a lot about the, the health and hospital system overall, given just the incredible um, uh, leadership they showed during COVID-19 as an example. I mean, I, I'd be very interested in, um, you know, when the after action um, uh, pro, you know, program begins, better understanding how what gets learned is built into the structure of the organization. And I'm right. sure that, oh, go ahead, Dr. Smith. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, please, go ahead. Um, right, we've already done a after action report that wasn't really after the action, but was sort of halfway through the action for both public health and OEM. But those were done mostly to just keep track of where we were going and what was happening and making sure that partners in the community were aware of what had happened. After the pandemic emergency uh, terminates, we'll be doing a real after action report. And you, as you mentioned, we'll be involving um, many members of the community, including many other agencies in the county that have participated in the response, as well as, you know, this community health clinics and fire departments and police and cities um, and CBOs and behavioral health. So it'll be a fairly large after action report, well informed by um, a separate but included after action report from public health, which focuses more on surveillance and response to the um, pandemic medically. One of the advantages we found, one of the few advantages that we found with this pandemic is that it's brought our public health department and our hospital and clinics much closer together. Um, in many times in the past, they sort of operated separately, but um, being coordinated and really together for two years has changed that remarkably. So I expect a lot of participation from health and hospital, behavioral health you know, also. So. Yeah, I think that's really helpful. And um, colleagues, what, what a, one of the things I'm, I'm wanting to get to is that um, on the evolving strategy slide, they're not numbered, so I'm not, I'm not sure exactly which one that is. Um, and I know, Mike, that's something you make sure that usually happens. Um, but you know, we are looking, for example, at how our evolving outreach is going to be managed. And it, and right now, what it looks like is that we'll primarily be managed by public health. And one of the reasons I'm asking the question is that I'm really wondering whether or not some of this work, uh, especially on the on the outreach side, um, should come under the um, the the office of or the uh, framework of the social uh, and uh, equity and justice coalition and in part because the information that's going out is is multi-departmental and not one department and you know and you know thinking a little bit about whether or not we need to have an area of expertise that's really rooted in the 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 um deep deeply um you know the languages and the cultures and all of that of our community is partly why i i raised the question and so i i personally would really like to see, and I know we're going to see a, a, um, a, a job description and a, and a, you know, a, um, a, a reflection of what all of the jobs are going to be like in the new department or the expanded department, um, Dr. Smith, that you referred to. I would really very much like to encourage us as part of the after action to look to see which departments make the most sense to have which functions, because I think a lot of that depends both on what we're preparing to prevent against, but also what the work is that we're doing in the moment, which I know you're all thinking about, but that would be really helpful for me to understand as one member of the board. Um, any thoughts about that, Dr. Smith? Good point. Um, it really is changing the entire approach to OEM in the past, it's been a small department that's rallied support from multiple other departments based on whatever the particular need was and the particular disaster that we were responding to. 
However, it's not set up for long-term disaster, like two years of activation. So um, as you say, um, since we anticipate um, longer term um, disasters, we need to have positions assigned through the right departments that can be responsive on a moment's notice. Um, and this has taught us that um, we need more supervision and coordination. Yeah, and I would say too that I think one of the other things that that this has also demonstrated is that we do in fact have the ability to quantify our investments and to, and to quantify the work that we're doing. And so I think that's such a great, I mean, th this is such a great launching point for the work we're trying to do even relative to our overall county budget that this is very exciting. Um, I want to just pivot for a moment to get a question and answer that was asked during public comment about what happens to the our current employees that are on um, unpaid administrative leave. Um, could you speak broadly about that? And then I, I, I'm particularly interested in, yeah, I, and and yeah, I'd love to get to more information on that. Well, fundamentally, the change in the public health order changes the uh, decision made that certain environments are not appropriate for reasonable accommodation. Since that's no longer true, we will be looking at reasonable accommodation in other areas. And we're in the process of reevaluating that from a personnel perspective. So I can't give you a definite answer, but there are clearly areas in the county where we still think it's unsafe to be unvaccinated, but uh, there will be more areas where um, we think it's not unsafe. Um, the um, actions by the fire departments and the cities um, are in their own bailiwick. They'll decide what's happening. In our county fire, um, the individuals who were um, going through the Skelly process will be rehired, or I shouldn't say rehired, their Skelly processes will be terminated. And so we have also um, the other department that I think is really obviously impacted is the health and hospital system. And I understand that we have perhaps 80 nurses that are that are um, out of our total nurses that are either on unpaid leave or in some form of reasonable accommodation. But do they go under this health order as well? What we're going to need to do is reassess each one individually based on reasonable accommodation for their exemptions. And so it won't be a one size fits all. It'll be based on the individual um, job and the individual need for accommodation. And Dr. Smith, for the, for the nurses, weren't, isn't that already what we were doing or no? We had an underlying county policy, which we started with, and then the public health order made that more stringent. Now we'll return to the county policy, which is trying reasonable to find accommodation. reasonable accommodation for everyone um, that we can find reasonable accommodation for. And but and it does sort of, the environment does change the list of high priority, high risk areas. So um, we'll reassess that. And obviously we'll be working with the unions. Oh, thank you. And when you say um, the, but just for nursing, I'm a, I, I know their, their whole environment is different than most places. And so Dr. Smith, the, the, what you're saying is that the, the change in the health order allows us to go back to our, our old policy, which is to look at reasonable accommodation and for the nurses in particular that are on unpaid leave, I presume that all of them had reasonable accommodation before that happened, or they would have already been um, separated from the county. Is that accurate? Yes. Okay. 
Um, so yeah, I, to, to oh. try to give a more concrete example, um, since we obviously can't go through all 80 um, people individually, but the um, state order and the county order at the time of great expansion of the in pandemic um, affected nurses who say, for instance, would work in the clinic doing mostly administrative work. Um, now that um, will probably change significantly so that they'll be able to come back with appropriate PPE. Got it, that's helpful. And then, um, thank you. And then one other thing that, um, that I'm curious about is that, are we going to do some sort of concerted effort um, as a next phase on getting home tests and 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 getting PPE available to people who would be interested in continuing to to mask up that perhaps wouldn't have access to the the, the um, better masks. We have plenty of masks available. What about the home testing? We're still expanding home testing um, gen, um, giveaway and um, we're assessing at this point how many we need and how long we need to be in that business. Um, and much will be decided by the board about how much we do. At this point, the antigen tests are available in multiple locations from multiple providers um, and health systems, but we still identify certain areas where access is limited. And so we still have hundreds of thousands of tests to give out. So um, what I'm very interested in is better understanding how our door-to-door -door work um, knits together the two issues that you just raised in part, and this is part of the reason I'm interested in having them not necessarily be under public health is that I'm, I am much more interested in the, the, the organizing model that we've developed and wanting to see again, the, these numbers that are so quantifiable. So, you know, I, I'm hopeful that as you give more thought to that, that that's something that we'll be able to um, dive a little deeper into and, and in terms of next steps. And in some ways, I'm a little nervous about waiting until the after action report for some of that, because it could be, I think Dr. Smith, you, you made good, a good point that we're still in the state of emergency. So when do you do your final after action report? And, um, you know, and so I guess one question would be, when would that be? And the second is, will it include all of the different um, emergencies we had to, to debrief? Um, we can't really predict right now when the emergency will be uh, lifted. Um, so we'll um, include everyone that we can in the after action report, but I can't give you a date. Thank you. And then, um, and then just lastly, when do the meetings begin with the, um, with the bargaining units to get people back to work? It'll Jeff, you put yourself on mute. We lost you. You're muted. It'll be an individual discussion with each individual um, employee. So these won't be discussions with the, the bargaining units. They'll be discussions with each employee. I'm sure the bargaining units will want to discuss the general parameters. OK, and when will and when do those discussions start with the individual employees? They're going on. Oh, okay. I didn't know that. All right. Thank you. Vice President Elmberg. Thank you very much. Uh, Supervisor Chavez, I really appreciate the, the line of, of questioning on the changes to, um, to the booster order yesterday. I Just to reiterate, I, I heard Dr. Smith say that county leadership is reassessing each employee's uh, exemption and how that fits in with the, the sitting where they work, the, the setting where they're working. Uh, and that there's not really, what I'm not hearing is a, a really aggressive or specific timeline 
And I know that we have so many employees um, who really are eager to, to get back to work. So I want to encourage whether it's an individual level or, or working on um, working with the bargaining units that, that ESA absolutely pre or whatever department is doing this really prioritize uh, getting them back. And in the meantime, um, I'd like to direct labor relations to work with the nurses in particular on a resolution on, on some resolution to alleviate demands on staff while nurses continue to be out with exemptions in the event that it's taking us more than a, a week or so to um, to get this resolved and to get people back to back to work as quickly as possible. Just want Dr. Smith, any uh, comments or, or concerns or acknowledgements there, please? Um, it's not, you know, it's individual managers and departments working with reasonable accommodation for individuals who have um, an exemption and um, there really aren't that many people, but it won't be a general decision about anybody. Uh, it'll be individually based. I hear that. Uh, my, my concern is, is more about the, the timing. Is this something you anticipate to be um, sorted in a week, several weeks, more than that? Several weeks. Okay, could um, you share in two weeks an, an off agenda update with the, the board as to how many employees are still um, on unpaid leave and what the status, obviously not individualized, um, but the status is of, of how many have been able to be returned and how many um, are still out, please? Sure. Thank you so much. Um, let me just zoom back now to the the, the bigger picture, uh, and I really want to thank the staff for for really ongoing, just superlative work in in so many areas of our response and now our recovery. Uh, with regard to the isolation and quarantine support, uh, thank you so much for including that uh, back in response to my my request. Uh, the transition plans that, that were presented for isolation and quarantine support program and community outreach are really helpful, uh, especially right now as federal and state endemic uh, plans have been released. With the wrap up of the isolation and support program, I'd like to see a final report on the supports provided once the pending cases have closed, including demographic, demographics of the residents served, like uh, the prior dashboard, and a summary of any lessons learned or recommendations for the future. And that can be submitted to us off agenda, please. Uh, I have a request and a couple other questions on, on some of the other transition activities. Um, as Supervisor Simidian has, has raised in the past, I also have some pockets of significant need in my district, uh, including the Cadillac Winchester neighborhood, uh, which has been identified as one of the highest risk census tracts in the county in prior reviews by public health. So as we transition from door to door to hub based supports, I would really appreciate very critical, very careful review at the census tract level rather than the zip code level and assure that a contracted partner is identified for every high need area in the county. Uh, any questions there? No questions. Okay, thank you. Um, and aside from the isolation support program and outreach, are there other specific response activities that are demobilizing or or transitioning soon? Not not just down not just downshifting. Uh, not demobilizing completely, but uh, decreasing capacity. Yes. I would say that in um, in public health operations, for example, we had a absolutely giant uh, case investigation and contact tracing team. Uh -huh. and we, are, we are no longer, and I don't think there are any counties any longer that are doing individual case investigation and contact tracing. Um, it's, it's automated, so that's significantly different. Um, uh -huh. 
we are not investigating all outbreaks. We're just investigating those where we think there's some public health significance or something that's changed. So a lot of um, a lot of the operations within public health are, are transitioning to a different model and one that's a, um, more scaled to um, what's happening now. Thanks so much, Dr. Cody. I, I appreciate that. And, and hearing the words again, contact tracing, just reminds me that before this pandemic, I had never heard the phrase contact tracing. I had never heard of social distancing. Uh, and just uh, where we are now is 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 quite um, quite incredible. Uh, the state the state smarter plan generally outlines an approach to deploy teams and research and uh, resources to future hotspots if cases go up or if new variants emerge. Is there a sense of how the state surge response would fit with our ongoing preparedness and response infrastructure? In other words, does the ramp up of state surge teams allow for the demobilization of some county resources? I think, I, I don't think that the state is sending out state teams to counties. Rather, I think the state is providing a blueprint for counties to use. So, um, and that's a difference. So for example, a lot of the state resources that have been deployed to counties um, will also begin demoving. Um, but in general, our approach is similar to that of the state, uh, which is that rather than looking at every, that the importance of counting and following every single case is not as important. Um, rather, it's a different uh, model where there's guidance and recommendations. If you're ill, stay home and get tested. Um, uh, tell people you've been in contact with, et cetera, et cetera, rather than having a public entity uh, run down each and every one. And, and um, a lot of the focus in the state's plan is also around surveillance. So that's you know awareness of what's going on and what's changing and what's different. Um, and we are well situated in Santa Clara County on that score, both because we have robust wastewater surveillance covering most of our population and since the beginning of the pandemic, um, or since we started doing sequencing, we've been able to get genomic sequencing on a much higher proportion of samples in our county. So I think that our ability to see something as it changes uh, is quite good uh, in our county. And that's going to be, it's important now and will be very important going forward. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Dr. Cody. I, I appreciate that. And really just the, this today's high level outline of the county's approach to ongoing pandemic management, I'd like to ask that a, a written plan come back to the Board of Supervisors prior to our budget uh, workshops that provides some more detail on the ongoing strategies, baseline capacity levels, roles of local system partners, and any projection of baseline funding levels to maintain whatever core capacities we need in surveillance testing, vaccination outreach, um, et cetera. I, I do recognize that we may need to surge up and adapt if conditions change, but but I want to be clear on what we would consider the core response activities and base budget, uh, kind of a base budget for COVID response in the next uh, fiscal year. Thank you, Supervisor. You know, there is something that uh, a leg legislative file that will come before the board um, that I think is going to be very helpful to you. Um, it is complicated because a lot of the work that we're doing uh, has come in the form of federal and state grants. And so we will be sharing with you exactly how all those funds fit together and how they fit together with the work that we are currently doing and will need to continue doing in the future and how it's funded. So I think that exactly the question you're asking uh, uh, will be answered. <laughs> um, and I, I, I can't recall the exact date, but, but um, but we do want to share with you uh, how we're, what the work is that we're doing, how we're doing it, and how the funding supports it. Uh, so, so that's uh, coming soon. Fantastic. And that, budget. Yes. Thank you. And I just want to make sure that I, I appreciate the state um, and federal funding pieces. Certainly want to know what we're looking at locally as well. So at the appropriate time, even though this is a, a received report, I'd like to make a motion to uh, accept the report with uh, 
the additional direction on that on that written report to come to the board and on the um, off agenda isolation support uh, wrap up program. Thanks very sure. much. I'll, I'll take that as a motion. Happy to second it. Thank you. I don't. I don't I'm sorry. Are you done, Vice President? Yes. I, okay. I don't see other, any other hands up, so I'm going to take just two more minutes of your your time, Dr. Cody. Um, if you could please go back to page 27 on your PowerPoint. And while you're going, I'm there, sorry. What page did you say? Page 27, Dr. Smith. You do such a good job including page numbers. I figured I had to use one. All right, while you're going there, um, what I will say to Dr. Smith, the public health office, everybody else involved, I agree having this mass testing and vaccination and infrastructure, and I'll say playbook in place, I think is so, so, so important. I personally believe we're coming out of this COVID. I personally believe this is something that may be around for the next 10 or 20 years. Um, I figure in my next flu shot next year, there'll be something battling COVID in that. But at the end of the day, I think it's very prudent on behalf of the county to maintain their, their playbook, what worked, what didn't work, and to maintain the infrastructure, the testing and the vaccination system, because another virus may come to town and just be, not be called COVID. So page 27, doctor, was the, was the one with the map on it right there. I don't know if you can make that any bigger or not, but I just wanted to close with this in my, uh, my two minutes here, is if we all look down towards Southern California, and look at our nemesis, the Rams, who happened to luck out and win the Super Bowl this year. <laughs> I just heard my wife boo from the other room. Um, you look at that one county down there in the bottom left, bottom left by the coast. The colors on this map are so misleading because that one little, that one county in the bottom left fourth of the state of California has more people living in it than 41 states. So that little piece of green down there, I just wanted to point this out, Dr. Cody, as far as me, how, how graphs and things can be misleading. There's more people right down there than in 41 states in our nation. With that, I am all done. Um, I want to applaud you, like I said, for plans to maintain our mass testing and vaccination infrastructure and a playbook so that Santa Clara County can be the first to respond and the best to respond once again when the next virus comes to town. And I think that's what we've got. We've got a motion by Ellenberg, a second by Wasserman. No other hands. Jill, roll call vote, please. Supervisor Lee. Aye. Supervisor Chavez. Yes. Supervisor Simidian. Aye. Vice President Ellenberg? Yes. President Wasserman? Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. We now move on to item number 18, where our Director of Planning and Development, Jacqueline Onciano, will be talking as we receive report from her department relating to neighboring impacts and benefits of short-term rentals and the usage fees, revenue, and history of ADUs. Yes, good afternoon, President Wasserman, board members, Jacqueline Onshano, Director of Planning and Development. The item before you, item 18, was a referral from Supervisor Ellenberg and Supervisor Lee that the board approved. With me today is Assistant Planner Joanna Wilk, um, Planning Division Manager Lisa McKyle. We will present this item to you. I would like to just say we did not send the PowerPoint to you as there was some very sensitive information that we needed to verify with the administration. I apologize to the board that you do not have that PowerPoint. And so we will be very methodical in our presentation moving forward. Thank you. Thank you. Joanna. Thank you, Jacqueline. Please provide me one moment to share my screen with the presentation. Thank you.
additionally, just for the board, um, we we the report that the board received was in collaboration with county council, um, but the presentation was not. And so we have removed their names from the presentation as they were not able to review the presentation um, before um, this meeting. Thank you. Gotcha. Hey, good afternoon, members of the board. Again, I'm Joanna Wilk. I'm an associate planner with the Department of Planning and Development, presenting on agenda item 18, which is a report back on a referral pertaining to those neighborhood impacts and benefits of short term rentals and the usage, fees, revenue, and history of accessory dwelling units within the unincorporated area. As Jacqueline had mentioned, the report was prepared with input from the Planning and De Development Department, as well as the Department of Tax and Collection and County Council's Office. On September 28, 2021, the Board of Supervisors approved a referral from Supervisors Ellenberg and Lee and directed the administration and county council to gather existing information into a, a report to better understand the entire landscape of the county's unincorporated short-term rentals and accessory dwelling units. The report back intends to allow a better understanding of how short-term rentals and ADUs have impacted and benefited the unincorporated areas in recent years. The remainder of this presentation will focus on the usage, fees, revenue, neighborhood impacts, and local history of short-term rentals, and then accessory dwelling units. Now, short-term rentals are properties rented for less than 30 days, and they're commonly listed on websites such as Airbnb, HomeAway, and VRBO. Short-term rentals are not regulated under the county zoning ordinance, except for one section that bars ADUs from being used as short-term rentals. As of December 2021, over 5,000 short-term rentals were listed uh, in Santa Clara County under the Airbnb website. However, only 249 or 5% of those were located within the unincorporated areas, and those locations are shown on the screen. A lot of these short-term rentals are located in single-family residential zones and within urban pockets of San Jose, as well as the eastern foothills. The county collects transient occupancy tax, or commonly referred to as TOT, from short-term rentals. The county collects 8% of the rental rate for each short-term rental. This is the lowest rate of the 13 jurisdictions within the county of Santa Clara, and it was adopted by the board in 1986 and has not changed in the last 36 years. In July of 2019, the county entered into an agreement with HDL to administer and enforce its collection of TOT from operators of short-term rentals. As shown on the table on the screen, the hotel TOT collection dropped significantly in fiscal year 2021, yet as of December of 2021, which is halfway through the 2022 fiscal year, the hotel TOT has already surpassed the last year's 2021 fiscal year total. So despite the decrease in hotel TOT collection, the county's affirmative efforts to collect TOT from short -term rentals helped mitigate that loss of hotel TOT in last year's fiscal year 2021. Staff would like to note that the finance agency is pursuing an agreement with Airbnb, which would allow them to collect and remit transient occupancy tax directly to the county. Short-term rentals are not regulated in the county zoning ordinance, and since 2008, the department has received about 20 complaints regarding short-term rentals. These complaints include, but are not limited to, issues such as overcrowding, large events, and noise. Of these complaints, only one referred to the use of an ADU as a short-term rental. The department conducted a review of short-term rental regulations in local jurisdictions across the state to better understand the issues that surround short-term rentals. The department focused on Bay Area counties and neighboring counties such as Monterey and Santa Cruz. So of those 55 jurisdictions reviewed, 33 allowed short-term rentals explicitly in their ordinances. They had a range of regulations in place, some of which are listed on your screen, and those include caps on how many listings are allowed in a dwelling, number of guests in a rental, only allowing rentals in the host primary residence, bans on large events, and off-street parking requirements. While the most common form of enforcement is complaint-based, 
some jurisdictions are using a third party company to find and report short term rentals. Now, staff will go ahead and pivot to accessory dwelling units. So, accessory dwelling units or ADUs are additional residential dwelling units that are on a property with a primary single family residence. And under state law, they are allowed by right in the unincorporated areas as well as throughout the state of California. ADUs are often used for family members or as rental properties. And under state law and in the county's code, they cannot be rented for a term shorter than 30 days and therefore cannot be used as a rental. And since the most recent accessory dwelling unit ordinance updates, which passed in March of 2020, approximately 74 new accessory dwelling unit permits were issued by the department. The department collected over $300,000 in building permit fees, and those fees cover the costs associated with reviewing and issuing those permits. In the last two years, there's been a 128% increase in the issuance of ADU permits, and the majority of those ADUs are located in the unincorporated areas of San Jose. A rent survey, which was conducted by the county back in 2013, identified 148 ADUs in the unincorporated area. Those ADUs charged rents for their units anywhere from zero to $2,400 per month at that time. The report concluded that ADUs had a positive impact on increasing the number of units in the unincorporated areas. However, that 2013 rental survey is nine years old and a current survey has not been conducted to determine the true affordability of ADUs at this time. So in conclusion, based on the research conducted in association with short-term rentals, the department recommends adding an adoption of a short-term rental ordinance to the department's work plan. Thank you, this concludes staff's presentation and the following staff are available if the board has any questions. Thank you very much, Joanna, I appreciate that. I'm looking first to any speakers in the public and we don't have any, so I'll close the public speaking portion and I'll turn to Vice President Ellen Burke. That was very informative. It really was. And thank you so much uh, to all of the, the staff members for, for your good work uh, on reporting back to the board, particularly want to appreciate Deputy County Executive Sylvia Gallego and Director Anciano for working with uh, myself and my staff um, to understand all of this, this information. I also appreciate Supervisor Lee for your partnership uh, on this referral. I, I also want to thank the Burbank Community Association for their help in identifying these uh, STR concerns within uh, unincorporated District 4. I'm glad to make a motion to accept staff's proposed recommendations uh, under next steps to encourage uh, discussion with the rest of my colleagues, but I want to um, make just uh, a little bit of additional direction. Uh, to staff's proposed recommendations and before I ask for a second, uh, because I want to be really explicit about the uh, TOT money. I want to be sure that any ordinance language that's crafted is done so in a way that does not impact the TOT funds or, or has a, a really a de minimis uh, impact on those funds. Um, our art community relies on the funds and I want to be very sure that we are not taking away um, and in fact, what I would like to direct administration to do is to look into uh, art grants, which are now available from the state to see if there's anything that we can uh, apply for that will help our arts community that is still significantly struggling uh, post pandemic. Um, I would at this time ask for a, a second uh, to my motion. So you do, want, you do want a second now? Please. Yeah. Okay, and you got the second from Supervisor Lee. Did you have additional comments or should I turn to the other supervisor? I do not, thank you very much. Thank you, Supervisor Lee. Uh, thank you, uh, certainly. Uh, uh, first, thank uh, the leadership of uh, Supervisor uh, Ellenberg for putting forth this uh, very uh, important uh, issue for our neighborhoods and protecting our neighbors. Uh, and uh, I, I do want to um, mention that uh, with regard to this, um, this ordinance, uh, some of the ideas I would like to make sure that would be included, and I hope the maker of motion will agree, uh, would look into uh, the various areas relating to those licensing requirements uh, regarding annual license fees, 
liability insurance, um, caps on the number of guests being allowed in the short-term rental, um, and also the ability to have a requirement to identify the local person's uh, contact um, and of someone who is responsible for responding to any uh, uh, neighbors uh, issues, uh, parking and noise uh, issues, uh, and also uh, the banning, potential banning of large uh, events uh, in these type of ordinance. So I would like to see if uh, the maker is willing to uh, entertain some of these issues to be included in the ordinance. Uh, I see Jack nodding furiously um, through <laughs> right. this, um, writing notes. Are, 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 do you have concerns with, with any of those additions or does, does that work in concert with the direction for the ordinance that we're looking for? We, we will come back um, with um, these items. Um, it, it works for us to address them. Perfect, thank you so much. And yes, Supervisor Lee, I'm glad to incorporate that in the motion in that case. Thank you very much. Thank you. Supervisor Chavez. Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask is, I don't think Sylvia's here. Okay, I guess she's away. So um, so this question may not be able to be answered um, today, but I would really like an, an answer to this. So first, I just wanted to say, um, Sylvia is not here, but I wanted to just say a very sincere thank you to Sylvia because in 2000, around 2017, 18, we were taking a look at our overall approach to arts, arts financing, our partnership with SB Creates, and really trying to better understand how to, um, how to address the fact that we, we knew we had, um, you know, Airbnb in the county, but we really didn't have a good strategy for collecting um, the, the TOT tax. And so if it hadn't been for Sylvia, and the staff's good work um, back then, we would even be in more trouble now. And so I just, she's not here to hear this, but I just wanna say a very, very sincere thank you to her for the approach um, that she took. As part of um, colleagues, as part of that action, it was part of a whole series of actions that we requested as part of our, uh, you know, addressing our, our partnership with SP Creates. And a sub part of that was really taking a look at whether or not we were going to be using business licensees. You may remember this, Mike, because I think this is an issue that that you raised maybe even some concerns with. My question is, is that is the business is a business license also part of the um, the work that HDL was contracted to work on? And specifically, I think we were trying to figure out how to get people to sign up for their business license fees because we didn't know about all these different um, uh, Airbnb uh, or short-term rentals, frankly, because we, we didn't have a mechanism for doing that. So did we remedy that? Jacqueline? If I may, um, Jacqueline and Shano, we, we are addressing it, the business license right now. We were looking at an actual registration uh, process mm -hmm. Um, that runs along with the business license or, or is in that category. But um, Marguerite, uh, Margaret, are you on the are you on the call? Because she could speak to um, if HDL okay, is. Go. She is. Yes, I am. <laughs> okay. Can you speak to if HDL is looking at uh, the business license or the registration aspect of um, STRs? Not at the moment. They are not uh, um, handling that piece of the contract. It's only the registration of the SDRs and the collection. Perhaps um, just, you know, I, I, I know that somebody was working on some part of it. So without, I don't want to make this more complicated, but if, if perhaps we could just get an off agenda that says, here's what happened with the business license fee approach. Because what I just can't recall is did, did the HDL approach take the business license approach away? I just can't remember. And part of the reason I'm asking is that you know, with any time we make changes, we need to make sure there's really robust education for our community so that we don't catch them doing something wrong just because they didn't know about it. And this is a pretty big change. And the reason I was remembering the business license, Mike, I think that was actually one of the concerns you raised was, yes. you know, making sure we just weren't catching people in a web, A and B, that the the the, um, the purpose of the business license view, uh, a business license was specific so that the fee could be adjusted based on the specifics we were trying to get, the outcomes we were trying to get. One of the outcomes was just knowing how many STRs there were, um, but there were others. As, and let me just give you one example. Because we didn't have this business license approach, 
we had no way of mass communicating with folks because there was no reason for them to have a relationship with the county until there was a problem. And so, you know, outside of, I think, maybe CUPs or other mechanisms for, for a basic office, I mean, a, a basic building, we just didn't even have an approach for that. So this was a, the STRs were a subset of that bigger discussion, uh -huh. which is why because I'd like to recommend they come back. Okay. That, that come back off the agenda. Yeah. Okay. And Margarita, you're not on mute, just in case you didn't know. Sorry. No problem. Thank you. I always want people to tell me that. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. So we have a motion by Ellenberg and a second by Lee, I believe, if I'm correct. Yes. Thank you. Supervisor Chavez, your hand is still raised. Did I cut you off? No, thank you, Mike. You're good. Okay. Thank you. And it looks like we're good. Jill, roll call vote, please. Supervisor Lee. Aye. Supervisor Chavez. Yes. Supervisor Simidian. Aye. Vice President Ellenberg. Yes. And President Wasserman. Yes. Thank you very much, Jill. 19 was handled on consent. 20, we have Consuelo uh, presenting here as we receive a quarterly report from the Office of Supportive Housing. And Consuelo, where are Thank you? you? Thank you, Board there President you Wasserman and members of the board. Consuelo there. Hernandez, your director with the Office of Supportive Housing. As part of the 2020-2025 Community Plan to End Homelessness, Heading Home is an effort to establish a system through which homelessness among Santa Clara County families with children, including pregnant women, becomes rare, brief, and non-recurrent. This is the administration's first Heading Home quarterly report. Since October 1st, 2021, the county and its partners have been focused on expanding temporary shelter and permanent housing options for unhoused families. These initial steps lay the foundation for increasing the number of homeless families who are connected to critical services needed to gain and maintain housing. There are three major areas of work we have focused on over the past four months. First, in an effort to expand temporary shelter options for families, we've increased the nightly temporary shelter capacity for homeless families by 94 units. This effort is supported by Destination Home and a $1 million grant of a $4.5 million grant from the Bezos Day One Families Fund in support of Heading Home. Our team has also worked with the centralized hotline for homeless shelter staff to ensure that unhoused pregnant women are placed on the family queue instead of on the singles queue. Finally, we're working closely with the VHHP team to monitor the referrals and flag any issues with our current referral process, specifically for unhoused pregnant women. And the idea is that um, we can make changes in real time um, so that that can inform any changes that we need to make to the program moving forward. Second is in an effort to increase permanent housing capacity and prevention strategies, our main focus has been on the implementation of the emergency housing vouchers. The Office of Supportive Housing's operation team has been coordinating outreach efforts to literally homeless families and providing training on the workflow and enrollment requirements um, for the emergency housing vouchers. And what this means um, for the supervisor's benefit is uh, we were able to expand our outreach contract and four service providers and referrals for 200 families that are on the queue that are literally homeless started March 1st. Um, and so what the team is doing um, is going out, finding the families, and then working through with them on the very long process that we have, unfortunately, um, to getting people housed, the documentation that's needed, um, and the submission of the application to the housing authority. Within this effort, we've also expanded the homelessness prevention system capacity by adding uh, additional 522 households, the ability to assist an additional 522 households. All of this has been supported through your actions um, seven actions specifically in support of this effort. And finally, um, we've been working with the housing authority because they do control the emergency housing vouchers to make sure that they use any eligible waivers that HUD has um, included in their policies so that families can move in quicker. For instance, one of those policies includes waiving um, 
the need for an identification in order to start the application process, allowing um, eligible landlords um, to self-certify that their unit is eligible um, with those certifications happening by the housing authority staff after. And what that does is it basically removes any barriers and reduces the time that it takes a family to move in. Over the next four months, our team will be focused on increasing the number of housing placements that happen and increasing resources by coordinating with cities and applying for additional state funding. I wanted to share the example of the most recent request for applications that was issued by the California Interagency Council on Homelessness. It's specifically for family homelessness challenge grants. And our team is coordinating with VHHP, the Social Services Agency, City of San Jose, Housing Authority, and Destination Home to put forward a proposal that would be competitive. Some of the points that would be allocated that make our proposal specifically competitive is that coordination. Uh, and we would come back to the board on April 5th with more details about the grant and what we would be submitting. Um, in addition to that, we're also working with the Social Services Agency on new funding that's been made available to two of their existing programs and finding ways to integrate those efforts into the campaign. Um, and finally, working on a dashboard that we can then present to the board in June to show you the progress. With that, happy to take any questions. Thank you very much for this first quarterly report. Thank you, Supervisor Ellenberg, for the referral. There's no action necessary here. Uh, Vice President Ellenberg, questions? or comments. Uh, thank you. Uh, some of both. First, um, Consuelo, to, to you and to all of the partners at the Housing Authority of Destination Home and social services in the city. Um, I'm, I'm so encouraged by this work and so grateful uh, for your efforts here. Um, I want to call out just a couple of, of pieces of, of appreciation and, and some questions. Um, it's so important that you're working on making this move faster and removing bar removing barriers, um, getting both the applicants faster through the process and landlords faster through. Um, do we once we've identified a family that's unhoused that we, you know, have uh, high confidence will ultimately be be placed in housing? Are we putting them immediately into a hotel or some kind of temporary shelter? Yes, thank you, Supervisor, um, for the question. Yes, that's part of the expansion. So the initial expansion was to address any uh, people that were on the queue for shelter. Um, if you remember last summer, we did have a few folks that were waiting for placement into a shelter. Um, so our first initial step was add capacity to address that. But now with the contract with Amigos, it will be specifically targeting families that are enrolled and heading home that are waiting to find their apartment and fill out all the paperwork, we'll put them temporarily in one of the hotel rooms while they go through that process and before they move into their apartment. So that sounds good. I just wanted for my myself, just make sure I'm understanding the how quick the access is. When we identify a family, so I, I wanna distinguish in case it means something different, um, the way you're describing when they get into the queue. Once we are aware of and see with somebody's eyes, an unhoused family or an unhoused pregnant person, what is the, the lag or process between hello, here you are and, and here's some temporary um, emergency shelter or housing? Thank you, Supervisor. It is a little different on a case by case basis. Um, it, could, it can happen as quickly as a week. Um, in some cases, a family may not want to move into a hotel room. Uh, when they do opt to move in, um, we're placing people within three days. It, do you have an example of um, a family that has told you that they don't want to move into a hotel? That, that's yes, supervisor. We, so for instance, we currently are working with 31 families right now. Uh -huh. um, and some of them are staying with, um, they opted to stay with a family member on a couch, for instance. Oh, okay. They're not on the street. We're not okay. talking about people who are, are wholly unhoused. Okay. okay. 
Thank, thank you for clarifying that. Um, I really also appreciate the work on the uh, collaborative challenge grant with, with lots of partners. I know that that's exactly what the, the state is looking for, is that broad cross-sector, cross-government, public-private partnership. So um, I really appreciate that as well. Um, is there anything that you need from us, from my, myself or any of my colleagues that can help move this faster, um, whether it's, you know, do, do we need additional outreach to landlords? Are you finding that you're connecting with enough landlords that you feel confident that we're going to be able to use all of these grants? What, what else do you need and how can you, how can you leverage the five supervisors with our contacts and offices and, and networks and communication and all of that? Thank you, Supervisor Ellenberg, for the question. Um, I do think that the board offices have been particularly supportive. Um, last week, the Housing Authority held their first landlord engagement session um, and through a referral from Supervisor Chavez, um, and I believe uh, yours as well, Supervisor Ellenberg, we sent out an email blast to all the board offices uh -huh. and did notice that you all included that in your, um, either on your social media channels um, or within your newsletters. So really for us, that is the biggest help. Um, and also your approval and the seven action items that you've taken since October. Um, that is, I think, tremendously helpful to this effort. Okay, thank you. I will look forward to the next report and, and please count on me for anything that you need in the, in the, in the interim so I can, can do my part in making sure we hit our goal. Thank you, Supervisor Chavez. Thank you. Uh, Consuelo, let me let me start with the barriers section. Um, what are the barriers? Are most of the barriers relative to federal paperwork? I mean, there may be a better way to say it, but is that what the barriers are? Yes, Supervisor Chavez, thank you for the question. Um, it is a bit of an arduous process um, because if you imagine the household has to, we enroll them in our housing program then they have to um, find an apartment, which we help them with. Um, they have to submit their rental application. At the same time, they have to get approval from the housing authority for the voucher. And um, we are doing it, it happens at the same time. Um, and what we're trying to do is if we can um, replicate the way that our supportive housing system is now, um, and use all of those existing partnerships to reduce the time it takes to um, go through the process. And also having the housing authority have dedicated staff that is working with the families in, e in the EHB program. So the federal barriers are, for instance, having a social security card, having a photo ID um, for all members of the household. There's a waiver that the housing authority is using um, to exempt families from that process. So, um, you know, one thing I think that would be really helpful for the board to understand in a little more detail is the actual process. And the reason is that if there are part, if there are ways that, um, you know, either rules or other actions that we can take to to make it less complex, because the idea of a homeless family going out and finding housing is just really difficult, even from a transportation online. I mean, that, that, that to me, that can be that can be overwhelming for somebody who's completely well resourced and has a job and has had full meals and doesn't, you know, I mean, they're just it's really difficult. So in that instance, for the for the 31 families that are in process right now, does each one of them have somebody helping them or are they doing all of that on their own? No, they do have an assi assigned case manager supervisor okay. that's helping them with their housing search and the documentation. And Consuelo, that person is from the housing authority. Um, no, that person is with our service provider. Okay. So, so it can be, um, either one of the four service providers that we have currently expanded our contracts to cover these families. Mm -hmm. um, it can also be Amigos de Guadalupe who is managing the hotel program for us. Mm -hmm. um, and then they have an interview process that they go through at the housing authority. That's a different. 
So part, I, it's, I know supervisor and, and we have weekly meetings with the housing authority staff um, to identify the people so that we know exactly how many referrals, for instance, right now, the housing authority has a hundred referrals that we have submitted for people that they're processing their application for. Got it. So here, here's what I would be really interested in understanding. And this goes back to the question raised by Supervisor Allenberg, which is not only what can we do to help, but the other thing I just want to say is that as it relates to our own county resources, wherever we're using them or, or grants, that we try not to mimic the, the rules set in place by other levels of government, you know, so that we're creating enough flexibility and freedom for ourselves to be able to to act. I recognize that the sustainability of this program really rests on the vouchers and that partnership with the um, the apartment owners. So, you know, I, I think, so I understand that. I, I, I just think better understanding the how of that might, might help us think a little bit more creatively. I just want to give you one example of something I've been really interested in us taking a look at, and that is um, asking the state to assist us with a, a partnership from DMB to make it easier for people to get the, their IDs and to collect the information they need for them. And I recognize now with the Real ID program, that's all become even more complicated, but I think there would be value in engaging um, either assembly member Cara's office or Senator Cortez's office to get some assistance with, um, you know, with the state of California to make that ID process easier. That would be great supervisor. Oftentimes our case managers go with the household that we're assisting um, and often wait uh, a, you know, a few hours to get through their application and their appointment time at the DMV. Yeah, and one, one thing that we may be able to do with them is locate a DMV that creates a little bit more of a specialization um, and able to help our families. And some DMVs are super busy all the time, others aren't. And so I, I'd really like us to take a look at that. And I'm happy if they're, if anybody's not responsive, just let me know. I'm happy to, to play a, a bridge in that. Um, the other thing I was really curious about um, is the, the um, how we are partnering with the school districts. Because I do understand that one reason that parents are reluctant to accept a hotel voucher is if that moves them further from their child's school. And I wonder how, how, how do, whose job is it to coordinate with the school district so that we're, we're really protecting children's, you know, ability to learn and, uh, yeah. Thank you, Supervisor. That is part of our coordination efforts. We have had some preliminary meetings specifically about the types of questions that we can ask. Um, for instance, I met um, a mother who expressed some concerns about the distance. Um, currently, she takes the bus um, to get her child to school, and so really finding an ideal location that's close to that so that the child doesn't uh, is not impacted. Um, so there is some discussion around that, but it's part of the next body of work that we'll be focused on. Um, I think after we get through the coordination with our VHHP and social services agency, that the school districts will be next. Yeah, one recommendation I would make is that um, I think it, there is value in reaching out to the County Office of Education just to ask them if they can assign someone now even to being part of the listening sessions here, in part because you know, we know one of the opportunities that we have to have, Consuelo, is a, a much deeper level of coordination and support. And the other thing is, is that, and super, again, Supervisor Ellenberg will, will know much more about this, but I know that the schools are also being funded, um, getting a little additional funding for children who are um, homeless. And so what they're able to do with that money, including coordination around, um, around transportation would be, I think, really worth us taking a look at on as, as early as possible. We're doing a lot of work in other areas with um, the schools. And so it may just be us taking advantage of somebody who's gotten to know the counties, the county a little bit better through COVID that may be of value to you in your work. And I understand what you mean about layering it. Um, here's just one other question. Could you just talk a little bit about the CalWORKs housing support program? 
Yes, thank you, Supervisor. We do currently have a partnership with the Social Services Agency um, where we take um, the participants of the CalWORKs program and cross-check that with the families that are on the community queue um, and coordinate with, with the Social Services Agency and our implementation partner in that is Abode Services. So really what we're trying to do is build that bridge between the families that are homeless on our queue and the families that are assisted through the safety net um, so that there's no duplication of efforts. And then the abode services team under that contract helps the households with supportive services and rental assistance. What we'd like to do is leverage the emergency housing voucher so that we can actually help more families. Got it. I mean, one one uh, reason I was asking the question is just that I know that CalWORKs, um, I mean, there's a lot of resources there, but also I feel like it's a kind of an isolated program. And so your ability really to integrate them sounds wonderful. And I would be really interested in how that functionally gets operationalized. Because I, because I, I do feel like what we wanna be able to do is put together um, the supports that families need to succeed. And, uh, and sometimes they're tugging at each other a bit. So that's what prompted the question. But also again, because I know CalWORKs has some resources for transportation as an example. Um, hard to know how all of this lines up with each other. So I will be interested in learning more about how we can leverage that resource. And I think you're really smart to think about how to expand that rental assistance. And I understand the goal is to take as many resources and stretch them as far as you can. So thank you for that. Um, my, last, my last question is, um, it kind of speaks to the overall approach, uh, Consuelo, and just a more of a question relative to the the partnership with the city of San Jose specifically. I was intrigued with the, the Evans Lane site as an, a location for families. And so just so I understand this, that the Evans Lane site, that 49 units, I don't remember how many units are totally there at that site. Because there, there are two, am I remembering that location properly? But do you know the total um, there on that location? I believe that is the total supervisor. They, the city is also working on uh, redeveloping the site for permanent housing. Um, and that might be the original project that you're thinking about was a modular construction. The city has pivoted from that. Um, and this is more of an interim, emergency interim housing model uh, with what we're calling Evan, Evans Lane in this report. And that, um, Consuelo, that's the one that's right next to the, the um the uh, addiction, drug and alcohol addiction um, services that, that, that the county owns that building? I believe so. Okay. So I, yeah, I've been out to this site and it's a, these are modular um, facilities with a sink. I think they have a sink and a restroom in them and then a shared, a shared um, eating quarters and the like. The reason I was asking that question is since that's very much family focused, are all 49 of those units being utilized in partnership with this program? Yes, Supervisor, the program is taking referrals directly from our hotline. Got it. And that, and are they, um, and are, are we then paying for the, the services at the site? No, the city's paying for the services. Wow, that's great. So they're, they're providing the services and the housing. And so we're not contributing financially to that? No, but we will when the family is moved into a permanent apartment. Absolutely. I understand that. That's really, that's very, very helpful to understand. And is part of the reason that, um, are there limits to what, well, never mind. I, I understand your point is, again, we're stretching the dollar. Like they're taking care of one piece, we're taking care of the other. Correct, Supervisor. And um, part of the work that we'll be doing in the coming months is to to better understand how we expand. Um, you know, we've been focused on the emergency housing vouchers, expanding um, the homelessness prevention system, uh, at least through this year, but um, then it's what happens after. And that's really where the city of San Jose, I think will come in. 
Yeah, that's really helpful. And I know, um, colleagues, I, I just want to let you know, I, I did have an opportunity to speak to Consuelo about some other issues relative to how we're handling victims of domestic violence. Um, so I won't need to ask those questions today, but I did want to say well done and thank you. Thank you. Supervisor Lee. Thank you, President Westman. Um, just like what the um, supervisor uh, uh, Shaw was mentioned by Evans Lane, I uh, had a chance to have dinner there one time with uh, some of the residents uh, and toward the uh, the shelter, the, the temporary shelter. Those are the modular units that's actually uh, very well designed with a uh, lift-in uh, suite with the, with the um, uh, restroom facilities within these units. So I thought that was a very, very well uh, done there. Um, a question is regarding the emergency housing voucher uh, you we were talking about. Uh, earlier, uh, Consuelo, you mentioned that there are about, was it, you say 200, is that 200 families that would be uh, getting placed with these uh, housing vouchers by March 1st? Uh, Supervisor, apologies for the confusion. Um, the original goal um, that we set in October is that within a 12 month period, we would house 1200 families. Right. Um, and it happens in waves. So right. we have, for instance, um, 31 families or so that are going through our hotline. Um, these are families that have reached out and we're coordinating that. Mm -hmm. Then we have the families that are on, are on the community queue. Um, we are working with 200 families in addition to the 31 that I mentioned. Okay. Um, and those are folks that have not reached out to the hotline, but they are on the community queue our team is going out to engage with them directly. Great, no, that's, that's uh, music to my ears, obviously. And I, I really want to thank you for the uh, ideas to like waive the ID to self-certification by the landlords. Uh, I'm, I'm very big on reducing red tapes to get these things moving faster. And this placement within three, three days is certainly a, a very uh, short time to, to get that to happen. So I want to say thank you uh, for that. Um, and along the, the question earlier regarding the city uh, participation, like Evans Lane, I just got a note actually from the mayor of Sunnyvale uh, regarding the uh, uh, the potential uh, uh, Sunnyvale's uh, putting in some funding to put folks in the Hamlin uh, shelter. So I just want to mention that and see if you could uh, uh, follow up with the city of Sunnyvale on that. I really appreciate that. Yes, thank you, Supervisor Lee, for the question. I know my team has been talking to the city staff there, and um, the outcomes of that arrangement are not finalized, but we definitely great. will, will uh, come back to you and let you know. Okay, great. And that's all I have. Thank you very much. Supervisor Chavez, your hand is raised. Thank you. I, Consuelo, just one other question. I, I know that, um, or maybe I don't know, could you just talk a little bit about the support being offered to the city for the, um, the the folks that are living in the flight path and how, if at all, that's impacting the queue of, of either this program or any other programs? Thank you, Supervisor. We have been coordinating with the city of San Jose on the, we call refer to it as a spring and heading. Um, and the Primarily the people that are, are there now are single adults um, and not families with children, as is the priority of heading home. Um, those that, um, before there were a few families that were there with children and they have either moved into, um, through our shelter hotline to one of the shelters um, or they are in the community queue and we will be reaching them out, uh, reaching them shortly. So there's a, a bit of coordination around that. Um, through the lens of heading home though, um, it is smaller because the, the majority of the people there are single adults. Thank you. And are the folks at Spring and Heading being prioritized either through BDAT, SPDAT or for other, other permanent or temporary housing? Because I, I don't really understand how they're all gonna be moved and where they're all gonna go. No, Supervisor, um, we currently do not have a prioritization for the help, the folks that are it, at Spring and Heading. Uh, the City of San Jose is working on a number of solutions um, around those folks, um, either by expanding and creating a new hotel program. Um, they are doing an assessment. Um, I think they are down to the last 40 people. Half of them need rapid rehousing and about half of them need permanent supportive housing. Um, I think they should be done with their assessment um, in the coming week. 
So we are coordinating with them, supervisor, but they're, the folks there are not necessarily being prioritized in our community queue. Thank you. Thank you. And with that, we've heard from the soups that wanted to speak. We have no members of the public. This is received information only. So we will consider item number 20 having been dealt with. 21 and 22 was on consent. Item 23 will now turn uh, to our district attorney, Mr. Jeff Rosen, as we will receive a report from his office relating to the Intimate Partner Violence Strangulation Response Program. Whoops, Hi, everyone. This is James Shapiro. Hi. Hi, everyone. It's James Kevin Shapiro from the DA's office. And Welcome. I'm here with uh, Kim Walker from Valley Medical Center and uh, Perla Flores, who's also joining us. Um, I'm going to share my screen. We have a brief presentation and then we'll be happy to answer all of your questions. Thank you. All right, here we go. All right, so we're here with a success story. Our county's strangulation response program is unique in California and it's unique in the United States because it provides victims with free forensic medical exams, free follow-up exams, and provides them with a victim advocate to accompany them to the exams and provide ongoing support for relocation and other services. The need for this is great. When victims of intimate partner violence are strangled, they suffer internal injuries that need a medical exam to see, and they need medical treatment. And there's no state funding for the medical exam, for the follow-up care, or for victim advocacy at these exams. And so our, our county program is meeting this need. Uh, the need is also great as measured by how often this potentially dangerous and deadly crime occurs. In 2020, police data from our county shows that there were 642 police calls for service involving domestic violence strangulation. In the 2021-22 budget, all of you made a limited pilot that we had started into a countywide program and throughout the fall of 2021, we've built it as we've outlined in the legislative file. I wanna uh, thank you for this success, which um, has meant that in the less than of a full year of countywide operations, really much less than a full year of countywide operations, we've nearly tripled the number of survivors who've gotten these exams and who've received the benefits of victim advocacy. The evidence from those exams has resulted in a high percentage of criminal charges filed and those charges being serious felony charges, meaning that we're being able to use this evidence of these very serious crimes to charge them appropriately as very serious crimes. I've received calls and emails from around the state asking how we're doing it, what we're doing, and how can other places build what we have here, including just yesterday, from Contra Costa County. We have some challenges. Our main challenges are to improve data collection from our law enforcement agencies, now that we have all the police agencies on board, to do more training for our police and EMS partners, uh, really focused now on line officers, and to make sure that we can continue to build on the success with ongoing funding for this really successful program. So I'm going to turn it over to Kim and Kim, um, I'll show your slides and you just let me know when to go forward. Perfect. Thank you. So my name is Kim Walker. I'm the nurse manager for the sexual assault forensic exam or safe program at Valley Medical Center. Um, and next slide. So I want to show this slide just to remind everybody that the strangulation that we're talking about, it's not just about the um, closure of the, the airway, of getting air to and from the lungs, but it's also about the interruption of oxygenated blood to the brain, which can result in a lack of oxygen to the brain and unconsciousness or untimely death. An important part of responding to survivors after non-fatal strangulation is to make sure that they have access to immediate and appropriate medical care. The injuries we see in survivors can be emergent, like uh, airway compromise, stroke, or brain damage or they can lead to chronic injuries like seizures, cervical spine damage, vocal cord paralysis, vision loss, or post-traumatic stress disorder. The SAFE Medical Director, Dr. Sharon Koo, has been working with the ED medical staff at Valley Medical Center, even before the strangulation program started, to advance ED assessment standards for survivors. Next slide. 
So one reason for this is to consider the risks and benefits of certain testing for inclusion and develop a solid assessment plan to share with other EDs and providers. For instance, this slide shows a CT angiogram that revealed carotid artery dissection, which can be life-threatening that could otherwise have been missed. However, this type of test also um, involves radiation risk to the patient. And Dr. Ku has been focused on finding kind of the optimal threshold for CT angiogram testing um, as part of creating that medical assessment strategy, especially as we consider expansion to other safe response locations in the county. Next slide. So currently we're documenting on this paper form, uh, we include the head to toe physical assessment, the history of the event, and any injuries identified. And when I say we, this is the safe medical evidentiary exam, not the medical care that's provided in the ED. Um, we also take digital images, provide ongoing safety assessments, and then consider the referral needs in tandem with the ED medical providers. And survivors are also offered a follow-up exam within 72 hours of this. And we document that follow-up exam as well, both for medical and legal purposes. Um, we are working on developing a database that is uh, part of what we've been doing for our sexual assault documentation, and this, uh, these exams will be included in that as well for the data and all of the other documentation workflow that we're establishing. Next slide. Um, I add this uh, slide just so that you can see this is what we do for the sexual assault exams, and really this exam uh, is virtually the same. Um, with respect to we don't collect as much evidence. Uh, the safe nurse examiners are seeing strangulation in one in six of our sexual assault cases. So we already have this skill set to be able to provide these, this service with no additional training needed. Next slide. Do we, should we turn it over to Perla Kim or did you have something else you wanted to add? No, I think that's it for now. I'll wait for questions. Perla, are you ready to go? Yes, thank you. Good afternoon, uh, supervisors. Thank you so much for your continued support of this program, Perla Flores with Community Solutions. And I want to share a little bit of the data in terms of the survivors that were supported through this, um, through advocacy and, and uh, follow-up services as part of this program. We have, uh, uh, during the calendar year 2021, 25 survivors were served and 26 advocates supported survivors. Um, nine of those survivors were provided with emergency hotel or shelter and 21 of the 25 survivors served engaged in continued services. One of the unique, uh, the many unique aspects of this program is that it, allow, it also allows advocates to initiate the exam when a survivor is interested. And we found that um, nine of the exams were initiated by community solutions advocates. Um, we find that the majority of the times when an advocate um, uh, offers the exam that survivors are more likely to engage. So really excited about partnering with the YWCA to ensure that survivors moving forward all have access to in-person response and accompaniment, as well as ongoing advocacy and support services. Thank you. All right, I'm gonna stop sharing and we're ready for any questions all of you have. Thank you, James. Thank you, Kim. Thank you, Perla. Supervisor Chavez and then okay. Vice President Ellenberg. Thank you. Um, first of all, I'm, I just want to say, well, how, what a far way we've come, right, from this getting raised at a hearing where we had, I think, um, Perla, I think it might have been Community Solutions or Kim, one of you who said, hey, we've got to focus on this area because we know that victims of strangulation are, are much more likely to be further harmed and the lethality and risk of death is significant and severe. So just you know, and to James, to all of you all working together to get us where we are. Um, there was one area that um, that I was very interested in better understanding, and that is where we are with our EMS partners. I, I remember that that was a little bit of a challenge because we were trying to get them also to do some coding uh, so we'd be better able to prepare, you know, for someone who was coming in who was being transported by an emergency medical uh, vehicle. Can you talk, to, I'm not sure who the best person is, but could I get an update on where we are with that? Sure, I'll start on that. So um, in um, April, May of 2021, um, EMS uh, changed the way they do their coding, as you say, Supervisor Chavez, uh, to make sure that they were um, adding and, and tracking more detailed information related to strangulation. For uh, example, they're tracking soft tissue neck injury, ligature marks, 
difficulty swallowing and a variety of other categories to make sure that they're tracking that and that that becomes part of the medical record and also part of the handoff uh, when uh, people arrive for medical care. And Kim may have more, um, but that's the information I have about that. I, I don't have adi much additional. I know that they had um, looked at adding strangulation into their training. They're talking more about mechanical asphyxiation but I think there's room for collaborative work and training to be done and um, identification response locations where uh, safe exams can be done. Yeah, no. I will, the only other thing I would add to that, and I'm sorry, I should have said this before, is that it's also been a really good uh, partnership with County Communications because they have added to their protocols um, a specific question about strangulation was and the question is was anyone strangled or choked and that's really an important thing for our 911 responders to be having as part of the conversation when victims call and it helps get the right medical and a right law enforcement response that's actually very very helpful um what i would like to do um i'd like to make a motion to receive the report and then um and then among that i i would Upon making that motion, I want to make a couple of recommendations. Okay, we don't need a motion. So go ahead with your recommendations and then make a motion for that. Okay, so one thing is um, I'd like to ask through the county executive that we get a full report from EMS as to where they are in the process, both of including the coding and doing training. And the reason, um, it, so that's that's my uh, main part of my motion, and then I'll I'll make a comment about it. Sure. Vice President Ellenberg, do you want a second? Sure. Thank you. Back to Supervisor Chavez. Thank you. And um, Dr. Smith, what I will say is that this has been, from my perspective, really one of the more challenging parts of the partnership. And there are some very good reasons in terms of why and how coding happens. But one of my concerns is that there's been a general um, reluctance to prioritize this. And I think that's it's actually pretty critical that EMS is included and that it is a prioritization for them to um, to help us by making sure they're asking questions because as as you know, as they're providing emergency service uh, that could actually be really important to the person's to the person's health and well-being. Uh, so that that's one issue. And then, Dr. Smith, I just wanted to ask if do you have any uh, is there any other information you need from me or any concerns or questions that you have about that direction? No, uh, we'll follow up with EMS. Uh, it's been a while since I've checked into this subject. I thought they were doing a better job with it, but we'll double check and make sure that the coding is being done correctly. Thank you. And also, um, I, I can't remember, and I'm sorry if it was in the report, and I'm just not recalling it. How long um, did we have funding for the pilot? This is a really great question. So. Um, going back in time so the first time this was discussed in front of all of you was in the fall of 2019 and just to your point supervisor chavez um i think it's amazing how fast um it sometimes county government is not lauded for moving fast on things that are even things that are super important um there's been a lot of examples in today's hearing um, throughout the day about things that have moved fast and this is another one so we started the pilot in 2020 and the pilot funding went through calendar 2020 and the first half of 2021. And then for fiscal year 21-22 that we're in right now, um, we have funding for it to be a countywide program in this fiscal year. So I think it's really great what we've built so far. There's a, a ton of room to build more. And I'm hoping that we can have ongoing funding for this program in the next fiscal year. So what I would just like to ask is um, if, again, if we could get this via an off agenda report prior to budget, I'm, I'm very interested in understanding what the current amount is and what we would need for expansion. Because it, it because I recognize now that, you know, we're going to need this for St. Louis, Stanford, for VMC, for all three um, centers. And then um, and then better understanding what the delta is with um, EMS, but that I'll I'll request through Dr. Smith and then, um, and I'm hope colleagues, we can include that off agenda as part of the motion, if the seconder is okay with that. Can I interrupt for a second? Absolutely. Um, actually, in, enhanced uh, 
funding for this program as part of one of the budget requests, which will end up on in the budget. So. Oh, good. So no off agenda report necessary. <laughs> yeah, please no off agenda report. Okay. <laughs> yeah, then, then if we can just focus on EMS, because when we hear this at the budget, I do want to understand where we are in that process. And then what I would just ask um, Kim and Perla and James um, is just to take a look at that and see if that you think it meets the needs, you know, of, of how we need to expand it. That'd be great. Great. Thank you, Dr. Smith, for that update. Thank you, Vice President Ellenberg. Thank you so much uh, to, to James and Kim and, and Perla for the report. Um, I have a couple of questions about the, the program and about you know, how the funding might, um, might, best, might best be used. Um, first, just want to kind of level set the, um, the number of, of survivors that are, that are being served. Of the 713 calls, it, your, your chart showed that 25 people were served. What are, the, what are some of the barriers to greater capacity? Yeah, so first of all, um, I want to say that of about 700 calls for service in 2021, um, Kim and her fabulous team did 83 medical um, exams for 83 individual victims. So that's really great, especially considering that um, we launched as a countywide program in July of 2021, and we're mm -hmm. building capacity throughout the fall of 2021 to adding more agencies and more ability to um, have more victim accompaniment. So I expect that that number is going to grow, but you're really highlighting an important point, Supervisor, is that um, we'd like that number to be as close to that 700 number as possible, that the number of people who um, are calling for help because they were strangled or choked are, are getting the medical help as part of that as well. And so a part of that bar barrier is to continue to build out with the training that we're doing um, and expand that training. I think that another one of the barriers um, uh, is something, and, and Perla, maybe you can talk to this for more, is that uh, Perla is absolutely right that the more that we've had victim advocates involved in that decision by survivors to uh, get a medical exam, because of course this is not a forced exam, this is a completely sure. consensual exam, um, the more that uh, they're, uh, they're getting that important medical care and as well we're collecting that important evidence. Perla, did you want to say something more about that? Sure, thank you, James. One of the things that we, uh, when we were preparing for this pilot, we looked at data, we looked at, um, during a, the same time frame, um, a specific time frame, we looked at data from police reports and found that in hundreds of police reports, only 13% of survivors reported that they'd been strangled by their partner. And when advocates conduct a danger assessment with survivors, which was one of the questions associated around strangulation, 40% of survivors um, reported to their advocate that they've been strangled. So we know that survivors are more likely to um, share that information with advocates. And we know that survivors are more likely to um, have an exam if there's um, advocate support. So one of the things that we've done is also ask law enforcement that if they offer the initial exam and the survivor says no, still call an advocate out, still have an advocate connect with the survivor, because we've also seen situations where the survivor initially declined the exam and then um, subsequently change their mind and, and was able to receive the exam and, and supportive services as well. Thank you, I, I appreciate both responses. The report um, says that the increase in felony charges for uh, strangulation uh, resulted in longer sentences uh, for those perpetrators in 2021. And I'm wondering if um, there's evidence or if there've been studies that that show that the longer sentences reduce risk of, of reoffending. Do we do we have any information on on the efficiency or the difference it makes to have the longer sentencing? Yeah. Well, I'll I'll answer it in a couple of ways. The first answer is um, um, I'm not aware, but I uh, could look for studies having to do with a length of sentencing as it relates to reoffense. But I think that there's also an immediate safety issue for the particular victim. Uh -huh. So when we're talking about someone who, um, uh, when we're talking about strangulation, what we're talking about is someone putting their hands around someone's throat. Oh, I'm, I'm not questioning the violence, James. Yeah. Oh, but thinking whether it's 
So, so, so there's an immediate safety issue. So I think that one of the issues that is important about this and a part about making sure that we have the appropriately serious charges and accompanying that longer incarceration is that it provides um, a very good measure of safety of the victim from the person who had their hands on their throat. Of course. I, I agree with all of that. I don't know that that addresses the, the question over time of whether a longer sentence, not talking about the immediate short term, but just if longer sentences um, result in, in less um, reoffending. And also just thinking about, um, we know that strong risk factors for IPV include uh, drug use, association with aggressive peers, financial stress, relationship um, conflict, things that, that you certainly know. Are you incorporating into this program um, protection and resources for survivors, um, attempts at rehabilitation for offenders, and efforts to reduce uh, re recidivism other than um, the longer sentencing? Yeah. Um as not as part of this program, but I will say that mm -hmm. our county is one of the pilot counties for AB 372, which is a, a way to let our county and five other counties uh, think about recidivism and domestic violence differently than has been done in the past. And uh, Perla and Community Solutions have been very involved with that program as well. But the idea is to that we're designing and implementing and now experimenting with different batterers intervention programs that are more uh, that are more designed to the individual person's uh, problems, needs, challenges, so that we can hopefully have better results for uh, reduced recidivism than we've had with the more one size fits all model of the um, uh, of the other batterers intervention programs that we've done in the state. And I know Supervisor Chavez that you've been a big fan of the AB 372 uh, experiment that we're doing in our county. So that, that's the main thing on the perpetrator side is not so much this program, but the separate program related to batterers intervention. Yeah, I think that they, they absolutely have to go hand in hand because whether it's longer or shorter, sentencing most of those folks are going to come back into our community and it's and it's absolutely in all of our interest to ensure that when they come back we do have um we have addressed ideally some of the the root causes and and are looking for alternative not alternatives to incarceration but supplements so that so that that's not our only tool because we know that it's it's not effective on its own. So I, I appreciate this. Um, I would be interested in, in getting uh, an annual update on the program at the public safety and justice meeting where maybe we can ask more questions and, and pull out some more detail. I think it's really important work and I want to make sure that it's part of what we're looking at in a very holistic way for strengthening our community, for increasing public safety, through a lens that really looks at early intervention risk factors, um, what, what do we do on the on the front end so we have less of of the horrific uh, harms that you've described today? So thank you all again very much. Thank you, James. Thank you, Kim. Thank you, Perla. Suraj Chavez, your hand is still raised. Did you have additional comment yeah, or question? I did. I just wanted to add something, and um, that's Mike's dog snoring not not anybody else on the I just wanted everybody to know this zoom on zoom um so just I, I wanted to make an observation about AB 372 so prior to that um we had a statewide and we and we do in most parts of the state a statewide program that is that is um I'm sorry that's a state mandated approach to how we address domestic violence and the problem with it is that to your point supervisor Ellenberg it is not evidence-based and so the attempt with us having local flexibility in terms of responding to, with something that is much more customized and something that we can research that is as, that is evidence based is the direction that we most want to go in. And I do think um, that there's a lot of value in having a presentation um, to 
public safety and justice on very specifically on AB 372, because I think one of the questions we have to ask ourselves in our county is whether or not the three things, the approach we're taking, um, does it really result in harm reduction for the families? Um, does it really address recidivism? Um, and also, is there a way for us to approach uh, the support of the family potentially different differently than we're doing it today, in part because of the, the way the rules are structured? So I think it's really critical that a committee really dive into that. And the one recommendation I would make is I think there's a lot of value in engaging probation um, in, in this discussion. But Laura, Chief Barnett has played a really critical role statewide in helping us think about this. And then one other point I'll raise, um, because I think this may have happened before you came on the board, is that we actually had a working group that took a deep dive into how we were dealing with um, domestic violence and sexual assault that was led by the um, Office of Women's Policy. One of the most interesting outcomes of it was a general agreement from everybody that the current system doesn't work and a real interest in looking at options. And because the group was so cross-sectoral, I think we had um, we had a very, I think a very thoughtful set of leaders really um, pushing on AB 372 and really wanting us to be one of those pilots. So one, one thing I'm a little bit worried about is whether or not that program is uh, being properly, or the approach is being properly resourced, and frankly, whether or not we're doing the right work on, in terms of the research, because we, we know we're not going to get it right out of the box. And so having that research component is going to be critical to making long term, um, I think, very significant and important change, especially as it relates to recidivism. But in particular, one of the things I'm very worried about is harm reduction for families, because so often families are re, re engaging and you know, the, as you know, um, Supervisor Allenberg, part of the reason that I know you and I are both so interested in children and prevention is because we're trying to stop what is at root cause. And we know that if you're a victim, you have a family member who's a victim, you become a victim, the chances of you becoming a victim as an adult are so significant and the chances of you repeating it are so significant. So I, I do think this is part of a bigger continuum um, of discussion that I, I'm very interested in hearing what the Public Safety and Justice Committee um, learns about that and what, frankly, we need to do to make it successful. You're on mute, Mike. Thank you very much, and I apologize. My dog is won't look, she's just grabbing my arm. This is an extremely important subject, which I take very, very seriously. Um, Kim Walker, your hand is still raised. Did you wish to make an additional comment? I, I did. I just wanted to tack on to what Supervisor Chavez said. Um, while the recidivism is important and understanding the perpetrator's you know, rehabilitation, I just wanted to make a plea for the patient. Um, oftentimes, the patient is in great need of services and the emergency um, requirements for themselves and their families is very high. Um, you know, they they often will re-engage with the perpetrator almost immediately, and it becomes very difficult um, to continue to support them outside of that. And so I would just want to make sure that we're looking at the survivor's needs as much as we are the perpetrator's needs. We've had several instances of femicide with people who have been released from uh, prison or jail just to go straight to their person and... Um, and at least three episodes of femicide in the last two years that I can recall locally. So I just want to put that out there. Thank you very much for that. Supervisor Chavez, when this started, I wrote your name down, which is my little way of saying that's who made the motion. And I believe we had a second by Vice President Ellenberg. Is that correct, ladies? That's correct. Thank you. Um, I don't believe there's anything more. I don't see any other hands up. So without objection, I'm going to turn to Jill for a roll call vote, please. Supervisor Lee. Yes. Supervisor Chavez. Yes. Supervisor Simidian. Aye. Vice President Ellenberg. Yes. President Wasserman. Yes, as well. Thank you. Thank you. We now Thank turn you. to item 24, going from the district attorney's office. Thank you all very much for that report to the sheriff's office.
Um, thank you, um, Mr. President. Um, we have Assistant Sheriff Sepulveda here to answer any questions that you might have. Um, the Board of Supervisors in August 2020 had a significant impact on the custody operations and during an already difficult time um, in COVID. Um, and so um, any comments you might have, um, Sepulveda may be able to answer. Thank you, Madam Sheriff. I see Supervisor Lee with his hand up first. And we did not have any members, just for the record, of the public wishing to speak on that last item. Go ahead, Supervisor Lee. Thank you. Um, I've read through the report regarding the need of access to healthcare staff for our uh, residents and our custodial facility certainly is very much needed. Uh, so one question I have is regarding the overtime. Uh, the 43 positions as being requested, obviously not a small number, uh, is proposed to help uh, relieve the overtime situation. So could you describe what the, the current concern in terms of overtime? I remember numbers are very large and the, how these 43 positions will be able to help relieve that. Good afternoon, um, President Wasserman, Vice President Ellenberg and esteemed board members. and. Uh, Supervisor Lee, thank you for your question. I appreciate mm -hmm. that. Um, <clears throat> the 43 positions initially um, will not help alleviate the, the overtime being used, but what it will do is it'll give us the funding to assist um, in filling that overtime initially so we don't go over our budget. But long-term, yes, the answer is yes, it will absolutely um, alleviate overtime. Right now, what we're doing is we're using staff on overtime to fill a lot of these duties and, and responsibilities that or we don't have positions or funding for. Um, and our plan is to start filling these positions and getting uh, folks into those jobs and performing those duties. What we're also doing is pulling staff from other positions to get some of these functions completed now, um, which forces us to not perform other functions and duties in the jail system in order to get these duties done. Um, that's why we do try where we can to fill the positions with overtime now. So as time passes, we get academies graduated um, and people into these positions, it will definitely reduce the overtime. Okay. The dull, well, so the 43 positions being created really would not be filled uh, anytime soon because of the training um, uh, pipeline, right? Well, I think what we can do is um, we can fill some of the positions. And then as we have an academy in right now, they're going to graduate in early June. And as we start bringing folks in, we're going to start filling in those positions incrementally. Um, and, and the other positions that aren't filled, we'll, we'll use the overtime to fill those. <clears throat> Okay. But it will now take the, us some time, yes, sir. Right. The dollar amount requested is seven fifty thousand dollars, which actually seems to be very small compared to forty-three positions. Uh, can you give us an idea how the number came about? Sure. That's the number that um, I believe OBA gave us. That basically they're prorating between now and June thirtieth, um, and that pro that that number will fill those uh, the cost for those positions between now and that time um for the for the new fiscal year obviously it'll be a much higher number for the 43 positions okay yeah, i might i might be able to jump in on this yes, dr smith yes thank you um so this uh transmittal comes mostly as a response to compliance with the one of our um, um consent decrees and the problem with uh, having um, a lower staffing ratio in the jail at this point uh, results in the fact that some patients are unable to get to the care they need or unable to be seen because they need escorts. Um, sheriff calls them multi-service deputies. Um, and we felt strongly that we needed to be able to um, get those positions with those assignments quite delineated. So those assignments are the highest priority for these deputies. We came up with the 750 as Assistant Sheriff Sepulveda says, 
as a, a, a amount that it will cost between now and the end of the fiscal year. And then fiscal year, you'll have these 43 positions in the base for the next fiscal year. Um, and, you know, we're also in the process of uh, trying to discuss uh, lateral transfer incentives and uh, retention incentives so that we try as hard as we can to fill empty positions uh, without having to wait for the academy. Now, obviously, the academy is a critical component, but we need more bodies um, than just the academy can deliver. So that's where we came up with the whole proposal. Thank you. Okay. And uh, I was told, and if you could confirm that uh, even though you're talking about transporting, this is not something they could just hire a driver to do, right? Because of the regulations that they have to be correctional deputies uh, qualification to do this uh, transfer of uh, these uh, individuals? Um, that's probably better for uh, Sapalva to answer, but they're not really transport in the sense of driving someplace. They're individuals who will escort uh, inmates from where they are in their housing unit to the medical units mm -hmm. and do support in the middle of the night for mental health issues um, and services as needed. But uh, Assistant Sheriff Sepulveda can give you a much better idea of what the assignment is. Mm -hmm. Assistant Sheriff. Yeah, yeah my pleasure. Um, these folks, yeah, they, they work directly with the uh, mental health patients and directly with the behavior health support teams as, as part of the team, uh, working with the inmates on assisted daily activities, assisted daily living. Um, if needed, they can they de-escalate, but, but primarily is to assist the inmate on a day-to-day -day basis, um, get them to their appointments, get them to their therapy, report back any type of um, behavior if, or if they're decompensating, they can report that back to the clinicians um, and work more as a, as a team with the clinicians in order to provide the maximum amount of care. So that's really, it, it's kind of a, we call them multi-support deputies because they um, have a wide variety of duties and responsibilities and they service inmates in all of the special management housing, which is where we keep our um, special, our um, seriously mentally ill or folks with cognitive disabilities uh, or any other type of disability where um, they would need support. Okay. And that's all the questions I have. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Lee. We don't have any members of the public speaking, and this is a request for approving the appropriation modifications. So I need a motion for this. I will move both items 24 and 25. Thank you. I'll be happy to second both those items. Thank you, Supervisor Chavez. Any discussion, board members on 25, since both are being included yeah, in the I just, motion? Supervisor Chavez. I just have one question, and I uh -huh. and I apologize. Yeah, it, and I'm not sure, Sheriff Smith, if, if uh, you know the answer to this, but will these positions, because they're healthcare access, will they have access to health information? Will they be included in health information? Um, no, not specific health information, but sometimes generalized. And I. Um, I think Captain Sepul Assistant Sheriff Sepulveda can provide more information. There's some information uh, that we need, but we don't really have access. So the, as part of behavior, um, or, and thank you for the question, Supervisor Travis. Um, part of their, their duties and responsibilities is to interact with, with the clinicians, and they are provided with a small amount of information um, to help them do their job, but more so what they what they do is they provide information back to the clinicians um, to help them with their um, therapy sessions or diagnoses or uh, whatever um, care they might need. You know, one I think one area that um, has concern has really always concerned me is that the inability for folks who are working so closely with those in custody not having access to information that could both be helpful in terms of the way you provide services and the way information gets back to um, to the clinicians or the doctors or other staff members. And I, I recognize that there's 
there are a lot of hoops and rules relative to um, health records for very good reason. So I don't, I don't want to minimize that. Um, but I do really want to ask, um, you know, that Dr. Smith and really um, James, you, you this question, which is whether or not we should be thinking about what what circumstances under which we want to make sure people on the custody side have information if they're not a clinician, but they are providing a service that, um, frankly, that, that puts them in very close uh, proximity to, to the person who they're supposed to be providing a service for. I don't need that answer today, but I would love an off-agenda report about how we make the distinction within those who are in custody over who can have access to custody health information and who can't, and how to tailor that. Not, you know, we don't want to be exploitative of people. Right. If we really are trying to improve services, I, it just seems to make sense that we would that we would take this, you know, take a look at this. And I, I would like that included as part of item 24 uh, in the motion. Supervisor, Thank you. Thomas, I can, that. Yes. Go ahead, please. Um, I can't answer a portion of that question for you. We do have behavior management plans that we work directly with um, Custody Health on, and that information is uh, shared, and that part of that information is how we go about uh, working with the patient, um, their triggers, and other, other factors that would assist us. So there's a portion of that question answered with, with that. Thank you for that. Yeah, the general rule is... Uh on a need to know basis. And since they're functioning pretty much as part of the team, uh, they have access through the clinician to considerable amount of information. But of course, they don't have access to EPIC or um, other medical information that's not relevant. Um, but, you know, they'll know their behaviors, their triggers, the medications, the uh, um, number of other issues. Um, they won't necessarily know what their BUN and creatinine are, but you know, they'll have what they need. I think, Dr. Smith, there's a little bit of a disagreement as to whether or not the sheriffs, the, the staff have what they need or not. And that's really the question I'm trying to drill down to. I think the point you raise is a really good one that, you know, I think we're all trying to serve the client. I'm, I'm just not sure that, that we're, um, we're always sharing information. At least the line staff don't feel like they have it when they need it. And that's been feedback I've gotten for years from people who work in custody. So I, I, I appreciate the perspective and, and would really look forward to a little more information from you and, and James. Thank you. Thank you. We don't have any members of the public. We've got a motion in a second that's inclusive of both items 24 and 25. Any other comments? Seeing none, Joe, roll call vote, please. Supervisor Lee. Yes. Supervisor Chavez. Yes. Supervisor Simidian. Aye. Vice President Ellenberg. Yes. President Wasserman. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Jill. 26, 27, 28, and 29 were held. 30s considering items removed from the consent calendar. Jill, you concur we did not have any removed? We had already included 24 and 25, sir. We already spoke. We, we already did 24 yes. and 25. 26 through 29 was held and 30 is any items pulled from consent. Do you agree no items were pulled from consent? Yes, sir. Thank you very much. And that said, and without objection, as I've learned from Supervisor Smidian, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Thank you. Chair. Thank you all. Yeah. Take care. Thank you.